Good morning. Welcome to the Committee of the Whole Meeting of the Cape Coral City Council. Today is August 10th, 2024. This meeting now comes to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Gunter? Here. Council Members Carr? Here. Costin? Here. Hayden? Here. Long? Here. Shepard? Here. Steinke? Here. Welsh? Here. All present. Thank you. Item 4, 4A of citizens input. It's a maximum of 60 minutes is set for the input of citizens on matters concerning city government. Three minutes per individual. Please remember to state your name and also to address the council as a whole and not as an individual, we can use the podium to my left and your right. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, Joe Kilrain, 20 year resident of Cape Coral and now in District 5. My comments today are directed to constructively inform the proposed compensation referendum and observations as to how it compares to executive compensation in the private sector, while well, I've spent over 40 years at very responsible roles, including CEO. It is based on fact and straight talk, which those who know me understand is the only manner in which I operate. Many of you are currently or in your past have private sector experience, so hope to relate to my comments. Senior compensation in the private sector is based on results and performance against established preset benchmark standards. The referendum as proposed has no such performance related components. A number of you commendably take pride on making decisions based on data and facts. The referendum includes none. There are no benchmarks by which to evaluate performance, no transparency, in numbers as to why beginning compensation levels are presumed and no targets for increase or reduction in compensation based on hitting or missing promised baselines. Instead, the referendum relies primarily on trust in council to perform, do the right thing, and future increases pegged to population increases. It is based on self-control by council with ongoing compensation self-approved by ordinance, eliminating resident involvement. The private sector does not operate that way. Compensation is based on performance with well-established targets and is subject to shareholder approval every year. Performance drives compensation. It is not based on trust, non-automatic, and not self-approved. Undisputedly, council carries a large workload and there's empathy for that circumstance. But truth to fact, the workload was increased by eliminating volunteer resident subject matter experts in five functioning committees, consolidating power and control within council. Successful executives understand span of control limits and delegate the others to perform, but always hold themselves responsible and accountable to shareholders for overall performance. One last point. On an even playing field of shared mutual trust and respect res between residents and council, trust might work, but it requires a trust but verify component. The current playing field is more akin to a war zone than a mutual trust playing field. Council trust has deteriorated to a great extent through self-inflicted wounds, and there's a long road ahead to get it reestablished. Thank Trust you. follows tangible actions over time, not words. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Council, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. City Manager. My name is Charlie Pease. Uh, I have some input on a couple of the agenda items today, but the first one, I want to be, be clear that I am here on behalf of the Cape Coral Charter School Authority Governing Board. Last night at our uh, monthly meeting, the Governing Board uh, made a motion for me to present our recommendation based on uh, a potential change or maintaining status quo with the lease. 
you will see a presentation today from Mr. Mason. We want to thank Mr. Mason for all he does with the, the charter school meetings on behalf of representing the city and working with staff. Um, in the presentation today from Mr. Mason, you'll see uh, information on the LCI, which is the local capital improvement funding, which was added through legislation uh, last year and is going into effect uh, now. And so uh, our position is that we want to make sure that we take into account future growth uh, to meet the needs of our city. And we should not, as a city, make the decision to increase the lease. Instead, uh, we should maintain status quo right now. There should, uh, we should utilize the time and resources to study the viability of using funds for other capital reasons. It's important to note that the five-year lease was just renewed approximately one year ago. And so we want to be able to take time before any consideration is, is uh, on the table for changing that lease based on changes to the uh, capital funding that are now available through the LCI. A couple of other points that were made by board members last night. Uh, the Lee County School District projects as many as 30,000 new students over the next five to eight years. It's important that we as a charter school system potentially be able to grow and use that capital for those purposes. And, uh, those are the main points. So in summary, you're going to see from Mr. Mason a presentation, and I believe it's on slide 13, there are three options that he's going to present. The option that we are in support of as a governing board is no change, it's option A, which is no change to the lease between the city and charter school system at this time. That won't be something you guys make the decision on today, but we wanted to make sure that we presented that context as a conversation start, okay? Two other items, so now I'm talking uh, on behalf of myself as a citizen today. I know I have about 40 seconds here, so very quickly, um, I would strongly recommend that we keep the status quo with the 430 meetings. It's important for public to be able to participate. Um, if you move the nine o'clock, I know there are a lot of important agenda items today, and you can see that uh, there aren't that many people here, even though these agenda items are important to the public. People like myself, who aren't uh, privately uh, in private business, have to take paid time off or flex our schedule. It's important for public participation and transparency. I would encourage you to keep those meetings at 4.30. And the last thing is I'd like to see very robust discussion. This is your only opportunity, I believe, unless you have another cow meeting, to discuss the compensation referendum item that's going to come up. So I encourage everyone on the dais to have that conversation and talk about the comps that are out there and the backup attachments that are in your uh, attachments for today when you have that discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Marie Cavanaugh, and I had no intention to come in here today till I read the news press this morning. Now you guys, you just gave yourselves, doubled your salary with a stipend. Now you want to put a raise on the agenda for voting this fall. Are you going to rescind the stipends? My guess is no. And if you do, my guess is it will only be temporary. Do not, you will not get a raise from the people of this city. And then the whole idea of changing the regular council meeting to 9 a.m., like we, we do with the COW, it's very difficult for people to get here at 9 o'clock in the morning. A lot of people are, have to go to work. They are at work right now. They'd like to be here, but they're at work because they have to pay your confiscatory taxes, your confiscatory salaries, your confiscatory expenses. And you know, you're putting a burden on us that is not right. You do not represent this, the, the citizens of this city. You do not. You do whatever you please and the hell with what we think. Classic example, J.C. Park. And I have yet to see one person come up here in support of that plan, except you. Except you. And then you expect us to pay the loan you're going to take out because the billion dollar plus budget you have apparently isn't enough. So you're going to borrow money to pay for this thing. It's going to be run by a private concern. Is that private concern going to pay for all the maintenance in that park? I doubt it, you're gonna throw that on the backs of the taxpayers. You people are absolutely horrible. And back when we did the um, JC, one of the meetings at the JC Park, Mr. Gunter said, as a body, I know, I know, I Look, don't you know, care. then please don't do it. 
Okay. Well, an individual up on the dais came out and said, oh, well, because we had, you know, the people got, had like 7,000 some odd names on a petition to go against it, and then the couple, you know, you had an event, you, and you added all those together, and you said, well, you know, that's only 2.4% of the population of Cape Coral. I have to think about the other 97 plus percent. Okay, using your own mayoral mathematic mechanisms, this same individual got, let's say, 60,000 votes. That's only 80% of the, of the population of Cape Coral, okay? So, and it's more now, more, more than that are against you now. That's for damn sure. So I suggest all of you resign. Every last one of you resign. We have a guy who didn't vote for the resolution on the, on the stipends, but yet he's accepting those stipends. That is the height of hypocrisy. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lori Lehman. I live in District 2, as you all pretty much well know. Um, on the minute, on the uh, discussions, the uh, proposed charter change, compensation for council members, I would hope that that will go out to a citizen's vote. Citizens can't be ignored anymore. We all want to know, we all want to have a say in what goes on in our town, not to be run by just all of you. That's not really fair. Thank you. Thank you. My name, my name is Francine. I'm a District 4 member, voter. Um, I just want to make one point. You people, let me get my answer. You people, this place at one time was very pretty. You take it in a way, the prettiness of the city. You can make, you're gonna make it another Miami Beach. Anyone else wishing to speak during citizens input, please come forward. Hi, me again. Um, good morning. Um, still, yesterday. Please state your name. It's Julia. And your last and name. And I'm a citizen. And your last name. Address me as the whole, because we're part of a whole. Your last name, ma'am. You have to give your first and last name. Why? You don't because give yours. The, we're not that's allowed that's to address are. you as a as a person. Yeah. I'm saying I'm here as a citizen. And Patty Cummings. Ma'am, what's your first and last yesterday. name, if you want it for the record? Oh, for what record? You keep taking everything offline, so there's no record. Um, we can't even and go on And you have to give your name or you won't it's be able to speak. Julia Atari. See, you how, keep how difficult was that? How difficult is it for me to call you John Gunther? How difficult is that? So, it's been called worse. Okay, you go as a whole. We're people, we're citizens, we're here as a whole. Got it? So now, Patty Cummings went to court yesterday and I've asked every single week, every single week, when we're gonna revote on her decisions. You still don't give me an answer. Can I have an answer to that? If I'm not mistaken, our city attorney has told you that answer time and time again. No, he said she's wrong, but he didn't give us an answer. He gave you an answer, but this isn't an open discussion. You can reach out to the city attorney's office if you I, like. I plan on that. The other, because um, we really need to address that. That's a problem because it's, the longer it goes, the harder it is because we can't go back in the records because we're, you guys are taking some of our videos off. Why is that happening? Again, this isn't a two-way discussion. Okay, so after I sit down, can you tell us why you're taking off the information online? It's supposed to be transparent and we're not getting the information. Some of these recordings are being taken down. I'd like them to be put back up so that we can go back and you know verify the stories that we keep getting, okay? 
because it's important that the citizens know you want to change the meeting time to a time when nobody could show up that's lovely you want to uh, you want us to vote and you want your pay based on how many people live here um, the governor doesn't get paid by how many people are in the state the senator doesn't get paid by how many people in his <laughs> district Congress doesn't get paid by how many people live in their district your pay should be set by the citizens that's it and again when are we going to revote thank you thank you anyone else wishing to speak please come forward good evening mayor council my name is Christopher Jackson I live in district 5 I'm going to take the approach of maybe the other side of the community um, I think that the compensation for city council needs to be increased. I think that in order to get qualified candidates on our dais, that's what we have to do. Uh, not everybody can work a job and do what you do. It is a full-time job. I see what's uh, entailed and what you do every day, answering emails and coming to the office and speaking to residents. Um, I think that a lot of what you do is a thankless job, and I think that there's a large uh, constituent of the city who agrees that you probably deserve extra compensation. Um, I think they're just not the ones coming up and speaking, right? I don't know if it necessarily looks like the way that it is now, but I'm sure that there's always room to improve how it looks. And uh, I just want to let you know that there are citizens out there that think that you're doing a great job and that the money should be increased. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to our citizens input? Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the council, I'm uh, Larry Gillis. I'm from uh, District 2, and uh, I uh, would, uh, before I came up, I went up to the lady in blue over here and over here and told her that someday when I grow up, I'd like to be as eloquent as she is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, uh, I'd like to address the question of uh, compensation for the uh, council uh, after the uh, stipend uh, controversy. Uh, I, I think that uh, you as a body uh, have limited your credibility uh, with, with the voters. Uh, I, I think that whole situation was, uh, was mishandled uh, badly. Uh, certainly the position that you have is a highly responsible one uh, covering uh, over 200,000 uh, persons uh, live here. Uh, you've got 116 square miles. This is a, a highly responsible position and was said a long time ago that a workman is worthy of his hire. You deserve to be paid well for the work that you do. And, uh, but I will say that the uh, stipend fiasco was, uh, was a self-inflicted wound. You, could, you, 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 you saw it coming. But I guess the ultimate question is, what is the job that you have? Uh, my own perception of it uh, is that it is a part-time policy setting position. It is not full-time management. That's why you have uh, uh, a full-time city manager who is uh, well, well paid for uh, his work. Uh, you're a policy making body, that's it. The question is how, how do we recompense you for the highly responsible work that you do? I think that uh, given, I was here when the uh, uh, meeting on the uh, stipend, and this place was, was a pulsating sea of humanity. Now, do you want to discuss salary in, a, in an atmosphere like that? And the answer is no, you don't. What you want to do is take a look at the job. What you want to do is take a look at the job and say, how much, in all fairness, is this job worth? And if you ask the voters, they will use a variety of expletives and tell you to do it for free. Uh, that would be irresponsible. That's, that's not the way it works in the real world. Uh, so my suggestion is that we make use of of an impersonal standard that has nothing to do with you. You cannot set your own salary. You can't uh, go through a political pantomime and set your own salaries. It's got to, you've got to have reference to some third party standard uh, as a percentage of some other, some other job like uh, uh, county commissioners or even president of the United States. In case you're wondering, you're being paid one tenth of what the president is. Uh, I, I don't know if you find that satisfactory or not, but there you are. Uh, my suggestion uh, is uh, that you do it, you can do it on a per voter, but I'm running out of time. This is terrible. All right, well, I'm, I'm still Larry Gillis, and, and good luck. Use an independent. Thank you, sir. Sir. Ma'am, you're only allowed to speak one time. 
That's what the rules say. Any other individual wants to speak? Don't citizens input? Seeing none, citizens input is now closed. Council Member Cosden. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to be clear because something was said earlier. Mr. City Manager, Mr. Mayor, did we ask you to remove any videos from the website? I have been given no direction by the spotty or any individual council member to remove videos. What would someone do if they wanted to get a video of a previous meeting? Oh, they just submit a records request to the clerk's office and the clerk's office would fulfill that. Thank you. Council Member Welsh. Uh, thank you. Uh, there was one resident who talked about hoping that our discussions today um, would come for, forward into a charter, uh, which would be with a um, referendum vote. And yes, that's what our discussions today will bring forward is that any sort of future uh, compensation package re regarding to um, city council would, would come forward at this next election coming up. So that's why we're having this conversation today so that we can get any potential change on the ballot for voter uh, decision. Thank you. Council Member Shepard. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, correct uh, one of the speakers that put out some mis misinformation. Um, it was correct that I didn't uh, vote for the stipend. Um, that is that is correct, but it is incorrect what in your statement was that I accepted it. I am not receiving the stipend. So please get your facts straight. Don't, don't put out fake information, fake news. So I'm not receiving the stipend. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item 4B discussion. Uh, 4B1 is Sunsplash Annual Report, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm gonna turn this presentation over to Assistant City Manager, Connie Barron. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Connie Barron, Assistant City Manager. It was about three years ago, toward the end of November that, of 2021, that we uh, entered into an agreement with Pro Parks to manage and run uh, Sunsplash Family Water Park. They completed their second year of operation, and they just recently reopened uh, for their third year of operation. Uh, Kirk Caffey is here from Pro Parks. He's the president of Pro Parks, and he wants to provide uh, the annual update that we give to council each year to let you know where we are and where we're going. So I'll give the, turn this over to Kurt. Good morning. Uh, Kurt Caffey, as Connie mentioned, from uh, Pro Parks Attractions Group. I uh, wanted to uh, give you guys a chance to get a little update on how our season went this year in 2023. Uh, I've got prepared a brief presentation, which I believe we provided to you uh, in advance of this meeting. And I would say some of the highlights are that we've, we've grown our revenues, we've grown our attendance. Uh, some of the, the key factors of that, number one, safe family fun. Uh, so starting at the right side of the presentation from a photo perspective, uh, that's, what, that's what makes this sustainable, providing safe family fun. Um, also value for our guests. We do very, uh, a lot of studies related to pricing and make sure that we are an affordable option. As you know, many families are struggling right now. We wanna be able to give all families a chance to come out to the water park and enjoy a day. And so we provide a lot of different ways for them to do that, whether it be through a season pass or a day, day visit or a resident pass. And, and as, a, as a function of all those variables, we provide additional add-ons and value for the guests um, by packaging those at lower prices. Um, I've also provided you just some, some quick updates on some other parks and what they charge for their parks and we're on average at least $10 if not in some cases 50 to $60 less than other large parks. And I think one of the big, big shifts that took place this year in 2023, you all will recall uh, that 2022 was cut short uh, as everyone here endured the Hurricane Ian uh, event. Uh, but this year you'll, you'll note that the, the chart to the uh, left of the screen shows a little bit more of a a, a stabilized attendance by month, uh, which is really what, what the park uh, thrives in, is being able to provide a longer season. Um, this year we were able to go all the way to December 1st, um, which was great in 2023. Uh, and so our plan is to continue to try and extend the season as much as we can. Uh, when we sell a season pass for $59, um, which is a lot of what parks sell a day ticket for, that allows them to come for all 170 operating days that we provide. So the more operating days we provide, the more value there is for the consumer. And that's really one of our big keys to success. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, and I just wanted to give you some imagery of some of the things that we do to make sure that people are getting great value for those season passes. Uh, we do special season pass op opening season uh, events. We did one here uh, the first weekend in March. Uh, we were also open for a full spring break period of two weeks. And now we're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sundays. We also give our uh, season pass members unexpected perks, like bring, bring extra friends on certain days. It's just a special way for us to allow them to come out and enjoy it. Uh, as I mentioned before, we package food. Uh, and other uh, amenities for our guests. Um, we also have really found some great ways to plug into the community. Um, we've done some food, food bank drives, some school supply drives, swim lessons, uh, and of course, uh, Santa in the park in, in the summer. Um, our, our key to success, is, as I mentioned earlier, is you know, all those variables, but really it's just fun for everyone. And I wanted to let you know that on a daily basis, our team works really hard to make sure that everybody who comes to the park wants to repeat the experience. As you guys know, as an owner of the park for many years, multiple decades, the park doesn't pick up and move, nor do the consumers, and so we have to give a repeatable experience to the consumer every year. And so the smiling faces in these photos represent what we do every day and what our mission is, is to bring family fun uh, to the marketplace. Uh, just a quick update on the rental income. As a result of having more operating days and growing our revenues, uh, we saw a significant increase in the amount of rent that we pay to the city. Uh, this is something I believe in our original proposal we said we might be able to do by year 10. We might be in these kind of numbers, and here we are in year three. Um, very, very pleased, or I'm sorry, the end of year two, uh, very pleased to be able to provide this kind of data uh, that's, that's got a positive trend. As I look to 2025 and 2024 this season, we're very excited about continuing to invest in the park. Um, we've, in 2023 and 2022, we added over uh, 35 cabanas. We've improved the kids' play area. We've done incredible amounts of maintenance, including refurbishment of water slides, refurbishment of the Lazy River, uh, and multiple projects on uh, food and beverage enhancements. Uh, so. We will continue to make those kind of improvements, but on a larger scale, as the uh, new racket center is coming into view and it looks exceptional, I commend e each of you and the staff that made that happen. It's a, an incredible facility. This will be a recreational hub for the community to share for many years together going forward, and we look forward to our part of that being uh, additional attractions. Pictured in the bottom left is a, an image of the wave pool, which we've completed all of our engineering on that. We're uh, final, finalizing our civil engineering and how that connects to the parking lot adjacent uh, to the north. Uh, and um, we actually will receive our wave pool equipment um, this week um, and be storing that until the, the fall when we'll be installing. So I'll, I'll leave that with uh, just a, a summary of the presentation. Be happy to answer any questions you might have today. Thank you. I'll open up for any discussion. Uh, don't see any lights on, so I want to thank you for coming today. Uh, you know, I've been on council since 2017, and one of the things that uh, I continually uh, pushed forward was to privatize uh, Sunsplash because I knew that uh, someone who does that for a living is going to operate it much better than, than a government entity. And over the last couple of years where you see the return on investment that we're receiving back uh, as a result, I think 300 and some thousand last year, a little over 500,000 this year. Uh, we were paying five to $800,000 a year in subsidies uh, year after year. So to see that uh, 180 degree uh, turn uh, is not only a benefit for us, then it's a benefit for you as well uh, in the private sector. So thank you for all your hard work and changing uh, the, the, the makeup of the uh, sun splash and and I think we still have a, even a better amenity today than when we were operating it. And there's, there's no uh, burden on the taxpayer to have to subsidize it. So thank you for all your efforts. It's, it's our pleasure and our passion to deliver that every day. Thank so you. thank you. Council Member Shepard. Yeah, I just want to take this time to thank Council. This was a subject uh, back when we voted on it that we took a beaten, beaten on for for privatizing it and having professionals that, that run water parks take over. And like the mayor said, even though this park is an asset to our city, it was, it was, it was, it was a burden to the taxpayer. And now, and now it's nothing but a, an asset and it's continuing to be a better asset, asset but it, it's actually a profit center for the taxpayers now. So thank you. Thank you, sir.
Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item B2 is uh, city council meeting start time discussion. This was uh, brought forward by council member Cosden, so I'll turn it over to her to begin with. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so yes, I brought this forward. Um, this is something council has talked about in the past, but not recently. Um, I think meetings are at 4.30 now, I believe. Um, I can't go back and talk to the founding fathers of Cape Coral, um, but my understanding from talking to someone that was with the city for a long time um, is that it was to accommodate council member schedules uh, with full-time jobs so that they could come do their one duty per week and come to the meetings. Um, it's very different now, and I think with our new pay, we, are, um, we should act as full-time employees and be willing to come in at nine. We do that for cows already, and um, I think that's made a big difference for staff. Um, I have lots of reasons, but I, I wanna say that my intention is not to hamper participation. That's not my intention. I understand there will be people who can't attend um, nine o'clock meetings, but there are also people who cannot attend 4.30 meetings. Um, back when I was a, a stay-at-home mom and taking care of my two young children, um, after school time, I would not have been able to come to meetings. So um, everyone has a different schedule. Uh, some of my reasons, I have a, a list here. Um, business should take place during the day, during business hours, in my opinion. Um, it's business friendly because we, we do business with businesses and um, other jurisdictions, government agencies, and having meetings during the day seems more appropriate. Um, it matches the times of almost every other municipality in this area except for Fort Myers. Uh, Lee County also has nine o'clock meetings. Um, it would reduce overtime in the hourly employees who come to our meetings uh, at 4.30. And there are a lot of employees if you look out in the audience um, in some of these meetings because we need people there for all the different subjects that we cover. Um, it also makes sense with building logistics. Um, security, we have a lot more security here during the day. Uh, it's dark when we leave often and it makes sense. It's safer during the day. And energy efficiency, we use lights, air conditioning, uh, technology um, in the evening for our 4.30 meetings. There are many other ways to participate for people who are concerned. Um, email, phone, in-person meetings. E-comments are actually included in the record of the council meeting. So even if you don't speak, if you send an e-comment, it'll be in the minutes with that meeting forever. Um, there's also meeting videos you can watch after the fact. We have the, our 311 system, which is a great way of getting problems <coughs> resolved. Sometimes we have people speak to us about problems um, that could be resolved using the 311 system. And finally, social media is a good way to interact with the city. So those are my reasons. I'm interested in hearing what my colleagues think. Um, hopefully we can have a good discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I know there was a presentation uh, that uh, was provided. Do we wanna put that up on the screen while we're having that discussion uh, as far as the other cities and times and maybe we can add that on the screen? Well, in the backup material. That way, anyone from the community does, hasn't seen it will have the opportunity to take a look at it as well. Council Member Steinke. Um, thanks. I, for myself, I'll be here either, either way. So from the standpoint of um, making everything happen in my calendar, in my world, on a weekly basis, uh, I would be here whether it was a nine o'clock meeting or I'll be here whether it's a 4.30 meeting. So my concern more is the ancillary people, at least from my seat, um, and that is the citizens' uh, capability of being here uh, and the staff members uh, that would then have to be here a much longer day when the meeting is at, is at 4.30. So um, I had always thought that having one meeting at nine and one meeting at 4.30 allowed citizens uh, that worked in the evening to be able to be here uh, for a, a nine o'clock meeting and for our citizens that have daytime jobs, the 4.30 meeting allowed them to be here uh, in the evening. I do know that uh, many of our evening meetings have gone very long. Um, I've been here at some meetings where we're approaching eight and nine o'clock at night. Uh, and when we have staff that have to be here for those meetings and they have child young children at home, um, uh, and, and quite frankly, in many cases, the citizens 
that have come to the meeting have left by then. Um, and so uh, I was just speaking with a group last night talking about the fact that um, it, it'd be great if the number of citizens that show up for citizens' input would stay for the rest of the meeting and hear the actual meat of the meeting and all of the conversations that go on, that that, that, that would be a great thing. So if the only thing that the citizens are here for is uh, public input, uh, like uh, Councilmember Cousin said, you can do that through email, you can, um, you can do that in a variety of ways through social media. Um, and so if it, all it is is to get your, your feelings on the record, there's, a, there are other, there's other ways to do that. Um, so for me, I can, I can go either way. I'm, I'm interested in every, everyone else's uh, comments. Um, so but just my concern is, is that I'd like it to meet as many citizens' needs as, as possible so, because that's, that's the reason why we have these. We're subject to sunshine. So and the sunshine laws, and for those that don't know, basically um, I can't walk into another council member's office and say, hey, what do you think about that whatever it is? Um, it has to be at this meeting. And so that's why they show up on the agenda. That's why Council Member Cosman couldn't talk about this uh, to any of us in our offices uh, downstairs because it had to be talked about here. Uh, and so um, to have citizens involved in that, I, I think, is a good thing. Um, although uh, having, having staff here until you know, late, late at night, uh, I, it's, not, it's not fair to them um, if, in fact, the citizens aren't actually here uh, and we could have had the meeting during the daytime during their normal working hours. So that's, that's where I, uh, that's where I personally am on it. I'll be interested in everyone else's perspective as well. Thank you, uh, Council Member Welsh. Thank you. Um, I tend to be in agreement with Council Member Costin, uh, mostly for a lot of the reasons that she already put out. Um, staff time being here after four o'clock, um, potentially to eight o'clock at night, having to have all that staff around. Um, knowing that it's a business meeting and not just a meeting for public comment, uh, getting it done during business hours to me makes sense. Um, there's, there's numerous ways for the public to get a hold of us and to reach us. And um, even, even last year, um, I had proposed in a, in a cow our thoughts or discussions about moving uh, public input to the end of the meeting so that we can get the job that we need to have done for the city done uh, and then and then work with public so I would be in support of any type of public meeting or public discussion town hall forums things like that as well but when it comes to the actual business of the city um, I have no problem moving it to 9 a.m. this way we can get work done uh, during working hours thank you council member Carr Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I'm thinking about it a little bit differently. I, I, I'm not opposed to a 9 o'clock meeting, but I don't think they should all be at 9 o'clock. Um, I would even go so far as to say that we should push it to 5 o'clock for the evening meetings. Um, so I would support a uh, one-night meeting and one-day meeting change in, with regard to our regular city council meetings. As far as staff goes, I mean, I, I certainly respect that thought, but most of that staff that we have here in the evening are salary employees. I don't think there's any cost factor associated with it. Um, I know their jobs are very busy. I think taking away a full day once a week or once every other week might be more intrusive to their jobs, uh, just my personal experiences. Um, I do think it's important to have participation from the public. I think having that opportunity in the evening is extremely important to many. There are some people that do show up for certain uh, discussions um, that are not regular attendees and I don't see that happening during the day with certainly with employees that have um, jobs that they don't control so I, I think I would lean more towards a, a one in one type scenario for discussion um, you know one nine o'clock meeting and then the other an evening meeting whether it's stay at 4 30 or even move, even move it to 5 p.m. is what I would rather see happen thank you yeah, I guess I'll weigh in uh, real quickly. Um, I guess my comment's kind of similar to Council Member Steinke. Um, you know, I'm going to be here either way. We have a meeting at 8 o'clock at night. I'll be here at 8 o'clock at night. Been here six years, haven't missed a meeting yet, so I don't think that's going to change. Uh, but I do believe, you know, our city's growing. Um, you know, we're 
a top seven city now. We will be a top five city. And when you look at other cities, not only in our area, I mean, if you look at the 10 cities on the list here, 80% of them are morning meetings during normal business hours. You know, whether we like it or not, we are a very similar to like a Fortune 500 company. I mean, we have over a billion dollar budget. We have a variety of individuals that come uh, throughout the day, uh, you know, for the business of the city. You know, I look back at COVID, I think one of the things, uh, one of the benefits that came out of the COVID era uh, was the availability uh, for people to send in e-comments. And I think that's very beneficial because not everyone can be here, um, even if the meeting's at 4.30. And so I think it's very important to be able to have uh, that available to the communities. And we do get those e-comments uh, earlier in the day before the meeting starts. I go through them, I read them. Um, so we do have that available to us. Secondly, uh, I think it's extremely important. I know all of our council members are available anytime during the course of a day or an evening uh, because I've met with individuals both times, sometimes during the day, sometimes in the evenings, which I think is even more beneficial. Uh, the people that come here and speak uh, each and every week uh, regarding uh, items uh, either on the agenda or city business, it's difficult to get your message in that three minutes. And there are people that come here every week. They know the process. They know that they really got to articulate their message as quick as possible. Um, so when you have a person that doesn't normally come to the meetings, it's even more difficult for that, in, for that individual. You know, I could say, you know, all the speakers that's come forward with J.C. Park, just to use that as an example. I've had one citizen sit down with me out of all the individuals that's come to that podium and spoke. And the reason that I mention that, you have an unlimited amount of time with that council member or the mayor or whomever it may be to really get your message across, to have that two-way dialogue. You know, I'm sorry that uh, we can't have that two-way communications uh, during our council meetings because we do have business that we have to attend to. Uh, but I would rather see more individuals in the community reach out to their council members, come to City Hall uh, and talk. And I'm sure every council member all the way down the line here will tell you that happens very uh, few and far between as far as instances where the community comes. Now, sometimes they'll reach out by telephone. That may be easier for all parties. But for the normal day-to-day -day operations of the city, um, I would support the 9 a.m because I know that there's other opportunities for the community, and in my opinion, better opportunities uh, to reach out uh, to the council and to be able to articulate whatever that message may be. So I would support the 9 a.m. Uh, start time, and I would also encourage the community to reach out to the council that I know would have those meetings during the day or in the evening to be able to hear their views and their opinions on a particular uh, issue that we may be addressing. Uh, so that's pretty much where I stand. I, I uh, you know, one of the things also, uh, before I turn it over to Council Member Hayden, um, our city staff, if we're not gonna go down this path and we're not gonna change our meetings, our city staff is not compensated to sit here in the evenings. I've been here to midnight. I haven't been here recently that long but I know when I first was elected, I was here 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night uh, quite frequently and up to a midnight. I think about 10 after 12 is my longest meeting, uh, which is, is way too long because most people after 9, 10 o'clock at night, whether it's council or the public sitting there in those chairs, they're, they're done by then. And really, you know, I don't think it's fair to have meetings uh, that, particular, that particular late. So I think during the day, I can support that. But if we don't, Mr. City Manager, I know your contract, uh, the city attorney's contract, uh, I know that you are mandated to be at the meetings no matter what time the meetings are. Um, but I think, uh, and I think our you know, assistant city managers uh, have, a, have an obligation to be here as well. 
Uh, but the city staff, if we're, if we're not going to make this change, city staff has to be compensated in some form for coming to the meetings because they're not now. So when they come here and they sit for three, four, or five hours, uh, in my opinion, uh, that's not fair to the employee. So if we don't change and we don't go a different direction, as a council, I think we need to look at that and uh, at least some type of compensation with flex time. I'm not necessarily saying pay, but if an individual here is for four hours, they should get four hours comp time somewhere else because uh, it's not fair to them. To sum it up, I'll support the 9 a.m. I think uh, as, as a top uh, seven city, going to be a top five city, uh, that's where we are today. A lot of the decisions that we make now are because of the size of the city. So I'll leave it with that, Council Member Hayden. Yeah, I guess a few days ago I was <clears throat> indifferent about it. I was okay with 9 a.m., but then I started thinking about it after hearing uh, a few comments up here, and then I asked myself, is there a compelling reason to change the meetings? Um, about three and a half years ago, we listened, listened to staff and moved the meetings from Monday to Wednesday because they, they needed more time. They would let, have liked more time to prepare, and, and we, un we understood that. Um, as, as we are, they are going to be here every meeting regardless. Um, you can make the counter argument that staff is in meetings during the mornings and the evenings might work as a better schedule for them, you know, allowing them extra compensation for a job that they're required to do. I'm not sure that makes a whole lot of sense um, at this point. 9 a.m. meetings, could present some parking problems. The business of the city is happening during that day. That parking lot fills up pretty quick out there in the front, the back, the side. Could be difficult for meetings that have um, issues that are um, important topics and we fill the chambers for people to um, be able to be here. More people work remotely now than ever before. Their schedules are more flexible than ever before which makes it easier for them to be able to attend 4.30 meetings. 9 a.m. meetings, you're pretty much starting to take sectors out of being able to be here, including the education community. They won't be able to make 9 a.m. meetings because they're, they're, in, they're in class during that time. Um, citizens' input is important. It sounded like uh, um, some of my colleagues are intimidating that um, it might bring less people here and they can respond by e-comments. The last thing we ever want to do is to be is put our meetings at a time where it could restrict people coming here and giving their voice to issues. So I think a 4:30 meeting, you know, certainly keeps the door open for more people to be here, to be more people to be in chambers um, to to present their to present their comments. Um, I think that was it. So, you know, it sounds like the consensus up here is going to be to move to 9 a.m., but I want people to think about the other factors that come into play when you move meetings. Um, having two separate meetings at 9 and 4.30, to me, that's, that's too confusing and doesn't work. And if you look at that schedule, we meet more than anybody on that schedule. We typically have four meetings, four meetings a month. Everybody else, there's a lot of cities on there for at least workshops that are as needed. So, you know, if you look at the schedule now, we meet, we meet more than anybody. And, um, you know, I just, I think the 430 meetings work right now, and I'm not seeing a compelling reason to, uh, to change them at that point. But if it's the desire of council to, Move at nine. I've heard from several others. You know, I'm going to be here regardless. But I think everyone needs to ask themselves: Are the reasons to change it outweighing the reasons that we have it that we have it now? Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Council Member Shepherd. Yes, uh, I don't care what what we decide. I'm going to be here for all the meetings. Um, I think it's our responsibility to uh, streamline, try to save the taxpayers cost, money, and to have uh, staff be here additional, um, plus different uh, 
as different topics come forward, if it's a local business or, or a developer or anybody coming with, an, with a project, they have to send their employees here for representation. And it's costly to them. And um, when it comes to citizens' input, um, like was already s said by the mayor, uh, I'll use JC Park as well. I, I had, uh, I think I had two individuals meet with me. And when you look at that, if a citizen comes to citizens' input, they have three minutes. Uh, I'll be the first to say it's really hard to get your feelings out in three minutes. It's very hard. But uh, we're all available. I'm, I'm available uh, all week long. So anyone that's uh, passionate about a topic, that wants to get more information, that wants to, their voice to be heard, um, to make an appointment with me, I know uh, the person that I met with recently at J.C. Park, we spent over an hour uh, uh, me listening to that individual's uh, feelings and fact-finding. And, and so she got a lot, that individual got a lot more out of meeting with me for over an hour than, than they would have at the podium for for three minutes. So I don't want citizens to feel that this, if, if this, the times do change, um, that their transparency or their involvement is hindered in any way. Um, we work for you um, and, we're, and we're available. Uh, I'm available from Monday to Friday and uh, really more than that, I've actually drove to citizens' homes and businesses on Sunday, on Saturday to look at different situations. Um, uh, I don't really care which way it goes. I will say that I've been here on Wednesdays from 8.30 in the morning to 8.30 at night, and that's pretty rough when that happens. So <laughs> if the meeting started at 9, most likely we wouldn't be here till 8.30. Um, but I'm here to do my job, and uh, whatever uh, the schedule is decided amongst council, I will live with. But I, the point I really wanted to make is I want citizens to know that their availability uh, to me is not hindered in any way and, and that I am available. Thank you. Okay, it looks like the only individuals, uh, it sounded like uh, Council Member Steinke was uh, undecided when he made his comments and Council Member uh, Long haven't heard from. Yeah, I, I support it in short uh, for a lot of the reasons that were already said. Um, you know, in my business, uh, I do a lot with municipalities all over the state, dozens, and almost every one of them does their business during business hours. Um, for a lot of the reasons that were stated, it makes more sense. Uh, and also for the individuals that come forth um, and, and in some instances have hired professionals in different fields to come and speak on their behalf, uh, those professionals also will be able to maintain those business hours as well. We're talking about attorneys, planners, um, those sorts of things. So it just makes a lot more sense for me uh, to do the 9 a.m. So I would support this. Thank you. Okay. Sounds like uh, Council Member Cosden, uh, you know, we can, we can go down the line. Uh, Mr. City Manager, if that's what you want to do, but it sounds like a majority is in favor of it. Uh, you know, with the way I kept notes, do you see the same thing? Council uh, Member Steinke, he's... Uh, as you're uh, moving it to our city manager, I, I thought maybe the city manager might be able to just speak for a second on maybe any, any feedback you've received from your directors as it relates to staff and what their preference would be. We're, we're required to support council regardless of the time. So it's similar to some of your comments. Uh, we'll be here during the day, we'll be here at night. I mean, our role is to assist the, the legislative body uh, this council in, in making decisions, providing you information, uh, performing presentations. And so um, even if it was on a Saturday, you know, we would have to make it happen. So we're, we're here to support you. Uh, I have spoken to all of my directors and all the staff on the possibility of going to a nine. Uh, we are prepared to make that adjustment if that is the, de the decision of council. Uh, we've looked at the calendars. We understand what would need to be moved, uh, how to accommodate it. Uh, we've had the discussion among staff to make sure we were prepared in case it, it did move forward. Uh, and so we are prepared to support it if that's council's decision. Council member Costa. Thank you. One thing, um, council member Hayden mentioned parking. Mike, could you talk about parking? Would that be an issue? Well, so if you would ask me this last year, I, I would have said absolutely it would have been an issue. 
Uh, we have, uh, since then, we have implemented appointment only uh, scheduling at, at our counters downstairs. So we have, you know, a set number of three or four people that are being served in any given time block. Uh, those are planned out for the day. We do have some ad hoc people that show up for, you know, passports or some other general governmental uh, interaction. Uh, but for the most part, the, the parking situation that we have had out front is, has been alleviated uh, by shifting to uh, online applications and uh, more or less doctor's appointment scheduling for, for uh, counter services. Thank you. Also, I think it's important to mention that our uh, DCD department, uh, hopefully uh, by the beginning of the year, by January, will be relocating. So that's going to free up an awful lot of parking uh, they, they won't even be at this facility any, any longer. And parks. And parks, yeah. Council Member Welsh. Yeah, I was just gonna ask if you knew how many spaces were across the street. Uh, you know, the short walk it is. I, I, oftentimes when I'm over there, I see that lot is, right. even in the middle of the day, is quite empty. Uh, and because mostly that's used to park city vehicles. And then during the day, those city vehicles are out and about. So by having a meeting um, in the daytime, um, some of the lots being used by city vehicles could be used by residents. So I don't see parking being an issue. Thank you. And Mr. City Attorney, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to move this forward, we would basically just need to do a calendar change, bring it back for a vote of council. Uh, in a, in, that's a great question. And I'm looking through your council rules and it doesn't delineate that with any level of specificity I'm able to identify right now. So all I'm gonna ask is that uh, I will do whatever you need in order to make that happen, depending on how it originally occurred, where it was set for 4.30. Does that, does that yeah. provide clarity? I know typically in December we set our calendar for the year, so I'm assuming that we have to revise that calendar and bring it back for a vote. That's true. The, what I do not know is whether or not there was a resolution that was passed at some point in time establishing the schedule where it was at 4.30 or 9. That's what I do not have any definitive answer for you. So if it is by resolution, then I would bring you a resolution. If it's just mere action of the council, uh, then at that point in time, there wouldn't be any document, but it may be advantageous to have a resolution. Um, I'm not sure where, where the council okay. is on that. Well, setting the time. Council member Cosden has received the second. So maybe you and the city attorney can, can work on whatever path needs to be moved forward in order to bring it back to council during a regular meeting. Is that okay? Assuming that, can we can we go down the line and just sure. be clear about who feels what way? A yes or a no. Okay. All right. Your answer? My answer is yes. Based on what I've heard, I'd be a yes. 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 No. No. <clears throat> there you go. All right. Thank you. And, and I may also, and I'll work with uh, Council Member Cosin, but it may be also prudent to put it in your rules as well. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak with, with Councilmember Cosson to find out what the best way to really do it. Because you do have specific times in your rules. It's just not specific as to when it is that the Committee of the Whole meets and when the regular council meets, so. Okay. All right. Alrighty. Next uh, discussion uh, is item B3, policy to review utility capital expansion fees every four years. Mr. City Manager, I know this is as a result of a discussion, a previous discussion that this uh, council had. Don't everybody jump at once. <laughs> okay, I think we're done with this. Uh, Mark Mason, Financial Services Director. Uh, as you'll recall, when we came forward with the utility uh, capital expansion fees, the uh, recommendation at the time and State law requires that we can only do this every four years. Uh, Council Member Welsh had brought up a uh, desire to set this forth in a resolution to make sure that we're doing it every four years. So that's what I recall. And I think we have a resolution ready to go just to do just exactly that. So at a minimum, we're looking at doing it at a minimum of every four years. And I think this was as a result of a discussion that we've had here, so I guess um, if there's no more presentation, I, I think it's pretty much straightforward that, you know, every four years, uh, at least whomever the council may be, they'll have that discussion. So council member Cosden, I, I think it's a pretty much a yes or no if, if we're in favor. So we just go down the line again. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to item four, uh, new revenue source for the charter school. Yes, sir. Mark Mason, financial services director. Uh, the You heard a little bit about this uh, during the uh, citizens' input. Uh, also, the last night we had a uh, meeting with the charter school board and went through this uh, at length uh, to talk about the this this, uh, this change to Florida statute and how the uh, Florida legislature has directed charter schools to be funded with uh, capital funds. And so I'm gonna go through a little bit of a history uh, with uh, you know how we got to where we are today and some recommendations or some discussion about uh, you know what we could see in the future and then of course we can have some options at the end about what we wanna, uh, what we wanna see that would come out of this. So the charter school system began and was created in 2004. Uh, we built originally two elementary schools in the beginning. Uh, we built a, uh, a middle school for the elementary schools to matriculate to. And then in 2008, uh, the city council at the time elected to build a high school to create the K through eight, uh, sorry, K through 12 experience where uh, the, if you came in th into the charter school system, uh, you had the opportunity to go all the way through uh, to a 12th grade education and then graduate. And in 2010, uh, in 2010, 2011 timeframe, uh, there was a proposal brought forward to build a gym uh, behind the high school uh, and at the same time build in some uh, executive offices. And so while, while we were building those, those buildings, each one of them, the plan was is that as we built them, the, uh, the PICO funding uh, that comes in from the state uh, would pay for the debt service associated with those schools. And so as we got into the, the, the final point of building the, the high school, uh, we would have maxed out on the, on the PICO funding that was expected to come into the into the charter school system in order to pay for the, the schools as well as the capital maintenance that would likely be associated with those schools. At the same time, the plan was is that the FEFP funding would pay for the operating cost of the system. Uh, and, the, and so for many years, uh, it did exactly that until around 2015, 2016, when the legislature changed some of the laws uh, associated with funding charter schools or capital outlay for charter schools and basically uh, limited it to about 1.5 million thereabouts in 2018. And so in 2019, uh, I guess, I, although I wasn't here, uh, there was uh, some concerns about the viability and the operating viability of the charter school system that led to the, uh, the administration to do some uh, review of the, the expenses, review of the costs, et cetera. And at that time, and still at this time, our current debt service on the four buildings associated with the charter school system is approximately $3.2 million a year. So in, uh, when the, uh, so in 2019, uh, there was a presentation that was brought forward uh, that uh, essentially talked about the funding support uh, for the charter school system. And the results of that committee of the whole was is that uh, administration was directed to go back to the charter schools and look at the lease, restructure the lease to reflect that the, the current availability of funding that I think is coming in from the state. And at the same time, look at the overall management of the several administrative aspects of the charter school system. Uh, in this case, that would have been fleet, finance, IT, HR. Uh, the, at the time, uh, the clerk's office was not included uh, for uh, maintaining the minutes of the charter school me uh, meetings, et cetera. Uh, and the grounds maintenance was also not included. So on February 24, 2021, uh, the management came back with a update on the charter school options uh, that, were, that were presented at the time, and they talked about the results of the financial forecasts, 
and indicated in those final financial forecasts at the time indicated that if the charter school system continued in, on the road that it was on uh, with the current lease that was in place at the time, that they would have depleted their fund balance uh, to zero and, and resources by 2024. Okay. And so the results of that cow was is to restructure the lease agreement from the $3.2 million down to $1.5 million. The lease originally uh, basically said that the charter school would be responsible for uh, paying the, the actual debt service on an annual basis. Uh, and so that was the lease amount. In this case, approximately $3.2 million. Went down to $1.5 million. When the state of Florida changed the PICO funding at $1.5 million, they set it at $1.5 million and then it would grow uh, you know, basically on a CPI 3% basis annually from that point. We would, the city would assume all the back office custodial service and maintenance of the charter school system. Uh, again, that still did not include ground maintenance, but it did include the maintenance of the buildings, et cetera. Uh, the direction at, the, at that time was also uh, determined if an outsourcing is an option that was done uh, and assumed all responsible for the capital maintenance of the system. And in other words, you know, if something breaks out there with regard to the schools, we're gonna go out there and fix it. If we have to replace a roof, we're gonna be out there replacing the roof. Uh, we also talked at the time updating Chapter 26, Cape Coral Charter School Authority, which we also did, and we explored some alternative funding sources at the time. And in effect, what, uh, what we came up with and what the city council ultimately adopted was uh, an ordinance repealing our 500 kilowatt hour exemption, uh, which was adopted in October, went into effect April 1 of 2022. The, uh, the repeal uh, generated approximately $1.3 million in 2022, $2.6 million in 2023, and again, $2.6 million in 2024. Uh, this allowed for, uh, so the charter school lease was amended in, on January 19th of 20, uh, 2022. It reduced the base rent to $1.5 million, uh, the, and it provided for capital maintenance to be paid by the city for all of the school system. In July of 2022, uh, the city then assumed all of the back office operations, uh, custodial service and building maintenance, actually started a little bit earlier in 2021, but all of the remaining resources uh, came over to the city. Uh, the the uh, employees were uh, brought into the city that were working for the charter school system. And right now, the cost of that back office work for the charter school system is approximately $3 million a year. <clears throat> On October 27, 2021, we also presented a, uh, to the city, uh, to the city council through a committee of the whole, uh, the, the option about outsourcing the management of the charter school system at the time. The results of that committee of the whole was no to the outsource of the management of the school system. And we continued at that time to update the, the uh, charter, the code, chapter 26 of our code of ordinances, which establishes the charter school authority. And on January 11, 2023, we amended that ordinance. And that, uh, the amendment of the ordinance basically made some, um, some changes associated with uh, the responsibility for the budget, uh, the res and um, also clearly defined what uh, services that the city will provide to the charter school authority. And so today, what we have is our current uh, and forecasted revenues and expenses based upon our current system as it exists today. And so right now, uh, the, the state provides PICO funding at about $1.9 million. Again, it was 1.5, it grew uh, and has grown over a couple of years. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the PICO funding here shortly, but the uh, the lease amount from the charter school system from that $1.9 million, they pay the lease amount uh, and about $480,000 is applicable to their annual IT related costs. For the city side, the city's resources, uh, it's the, the total PST funding is approximately $2.6 million a year. Uh, we would see that grow as the, as the system, uh, as more uh, 
properties are added to, or more meters are added to the system with LCEC. The charter school lease uh, contribution in from the charter school system, $1.5 million for a total annual funding uh, for debt and capital maintenance of $4.1 million. Uh, we pay the debt service amount, again, it's uh, $3.187, $3.2 million. Uh, the estimated capital expenses today is $653,000. And so we have a little net carryover right now for future capital improvements. And as you can see, if we continued this system over time, uh, we would be certainly able, uh, well <coughs> and able to continue to maintain and manage the school system based upon this funding alone, All right? We would run into some, some minor issues in uh, 20, 26 and 27, but you know, we would manage that with you know, simply deferring out maintenance to another year. So during the 2023 legislative session, uh, some changes were made to Florida Statute 1013.62, Charter Schools Capital Outlay Funding. Part of that change was to amend uh, and uh, the, and <coughs> was, was amended to reflect the charter, charter capital outlay uh, would consist of now both state funds and that is appropriated through uh, uh, on an annual basis uh, for the school system, as well as revenue resulting from something called the, dis the discretionary millage, which is authorized for school districts to levy on an annual basis in order to fund their capital programming. And so the, the, uh, what they call this, this 1.5 mil levy is the discretionary millage for the charter school system. But for this change of name of, for this funding source, it's called the Local Capital Improvement Funds. And so they also added in this statute that to be eligible to receive these funds, that we would have to attest in writing to the department, in this case the Department of Education, that uh, if the charter school is not renewed or terminated, that any unencumbered funds associated with these LCI funds uh, would be uh, as well as any property that was purchased with these funds. And purchased is, you know, lease purchased or just simply purchased, not leased, uh, would revert back to the school district if something like that were to occur. Now, certainly that's not on the horizon for our charter school system, but it's important to understand this and, and how these funds are going to be used or recommended to be used. And of course, at the same time, it talked about the calculation and the distribution methodology associated with this new funding source. And specifically in this case, they put it in place for the school districts to absorb this over a period of time, in this case, five years, to where it would be 20% in one year, 40% the next year, 60, 80, and then 100% in 2028. So the calculation uh, for this local capital improvement is, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a very simple calculation, but it starts out with the taxable value of the school district. In this case, the total taxable value of the school district is $145 billion. You take 1.5 mils of that, your total estimated local capital improvement uh, funds or revenue is 208 million. The statute provides for uh, the reduction of current debt service obligations by the school district, in this case it's 19 million, uh, and you would subtract that from the 208 million and you get a adjusted LCI revenue of 189 million. Then you divide that by the total number of students that are in the district. In this case it's 96,000 students, 97,000 students, and uh, which is made up of two categories of student. Uh, one, the district capital outlay, FTE for the district, uh, the number of students in the district system, and then the number of students that are in the charter systems. This gives you a local capital improvement per FTE or per student of $1,953. This calculates then out to about $25 million, $26 million uh, for the LCI funds that would be then shared with the charter school system. Now currently the statute reads that if there are any funds that are appropriated for the PICO funding, uh, this would be re reduced from the local capital amount 
and so the maximum amount of the charter school allocation would then be 17.4 million, of which the, all the charter schools in the, in the area shared in $3.5 million. And that's 20% of the $17 million. Now clearly, and we'll show that in a minute. And so the, the highlighted uh, are our schools, but this is the complete list of all the charter schools that are currently in uh, the area in uh, Lee County. Uh, for us, uh, we are the largest charter school system in Lee County uh, when, it, when taken as a whole. Uh, after us comes Gateway Charter School uh, Authority, uh, ch sorry, Gateway Charter Elementary School. Uh, I think it's actually more than an elementary school, but in, in any event, that's the name of it. Uh, and they have 2,800 students associated with that, with Bonita Springs Charter School just a little bit behind that. Most of the other charter schools are fairly small, so there's, they're actually, you know, experience in very small numbers, you know, in the 20% share, but as the 100% share comes into play, it'll be a lot, much larger number. For us, you can see that overall, that was about $230,000 per school, uh, because each one of our schools has approximately 800 students in them. So overall, in this particular year, in 2024, the distribution that came to the, to the charter school system was 909,000. Okay, so what does all this mean? It, it, you know, it's a lot of data, it's a lot of talk about you know, how the charter school was funded, and uh, it, I think at fundamentally, uh, the state has now recognized that the PICO funding has not been, by itself, has it been insufficient to fund uh, the capital for charter schools. At the same time, uh, I think, uh, as was recognized by the City Council when the meetings were held in 2018, 2019, 2020, that the education delivery has been impacted by the Florida education, you know, by utilizing the Florida education funding or the FEFP money for funding both leases and repairs in the system. And of course, I think what really comes out of this more than anything else is that uh, the, the, uh, the legislature has recognized that there should be equal funding of the capital funding that is raised by the school district among all of the schools that are in the district. In this case, all of the charter schools and the school districts, now you're basically creating a fairer education environment by utilizing the funding sources that are associated with the school district that weren't there before. And so we've, we've forecasted essentially what we think may happen, assuming uh, that you know, we see uh, you know, certain adjustments associated with uh, you know, increases in property values. So over time, you would see that this overall funding would go up as the taxable value in the county increases, so too will the 1.5 mills increase, so too will the actual amount of distribution also take into effect the, uh, the amount that will be distributed. But at the same time, we also expect, as uh, Dr. Manaya pointed out last night, I think they're expecting an additional 20,000 students uh, within the school district over the next eight years. Uh, and uh, so certainly the more schools that enter into the district or the more schools that enter into charter schools, there's a bigger split. But right now, we, I'm still estimating somewhere in the $1.9 million, uh, sorry, the $1,960 range per student. So the LCI calculation, uh, I wanted to take it out over its five-year period, uh, assuming that you know, we see this type of growth. And I'm also taking into account that at this point in time, the PICO funding doesn't reduce and it doesn't go down because I really believe that the legislature over time will reduce the amount of the PICO funding and then the reliance on capital, the local capital outlay will be held at the at the local level. And so the, uh, in, in this case, what we're looking at is that the LCI calculation in 2025 would be approximately $7.2 million uh, for, that is just for the charter school system for 2025. The PICO amount would be 2.1, so the, the, the charter school LCI allocation would go down to 5.1. And then, uh, so the, the amount in excess of the PICO funding would be about $2 million. When you add the PICO and the LCI funding together, it comes in at $4.2 million, the annual debt service at $3.2 million, 
annual bus purchases, PC uh, property and casualty insurance, which is allowable to be paid from the capital funding, as well as any annual IT related cost, would allow for a net ad uh, additional capital outlay of 621,000. Estimated annual maintenance cost is about $1,000,000, million, so that we'd, we'd be in a bit of a shortfall at that, at that point in the first year. But this, this particular structure here assumes that the, the, the lease is reverted back to its original form uh, prior to the change. So, in other words, if all of this occurred, the city would fund the, uh, I'm sorry, the charter school funding would utilize the LCI funds to pick up its annual related capital cost, it would pick up its annual property and casualty insurance funding, it would pick up its charter school bus purchases because only the buses can be purchased. Uh, the LCI funds cannot be used to pay for their leases, which is very interesting. But in any event, it's, very, it's, uh, it's pretty well black and white in the, in the uh, statute about how buses are purchased. And so, and then of course, then the annual debt service would be fully funded with these funds. Over the first couple of years, because we'd only be collecting 40% or 60% of the funds until we get into the 80 or 100% of the funds, uh, we would still utilize a certain portion of the, uh, of the current PST funding that is associated with this uh, in order to make up the, the, uh, the the negatives that we have with maintaining the capital uh, outlay or the capital expense associated with the charter school system. But by 2027, when, when we're in the 80% range, then uh, you know, the PSD funding could be redirected or re reassigned to something else uh, as opposed to uh, funding the charter school system as it exists today. And so we get to the end, I'm, I'm at the end. Uh, you know, so we, we have some options. Uh, one of the options uh, that you heard that the Charter School Board believes should be uh, done is that no change to the lease between the city and the charter school system. Uh, so the city would continue to pick up 53% of the cost of the debt service, 100% of the cost of the capital expenses. Uh, all capital funding would then accrue to the charter school authority uh, with very little to be able to do with it. Uh, B, uh, amend the lease to uh, between the city and the charter school system, recover full cost of the debt service, 100% of the capital funding for the capital expenses. The city would continue to maintain the charter school buildings, nothing would change. We would continue to do all the capital expenses, net of any of the buses, IT costs, or the property casualty insurance. Uh, with the clear understanding that the charter school system should have first pass at the funding necessary for IT costs, et cetera, uh, before uh, the final amount would come over to the city. And then I also put on here C was a look at an alternative service delivery for the charter schools. What this really means is, you know, the potential of doing something in between or whatever it is that city council had a desire to do. Um, so the, uh, so right now I'm here for any questions and discussions. There are two pages that are at the end of this document. They are basically the law uh, associated with what the funds can be used for. Uh, and so if you want me to go through those, I can certainly go through those. But other than that, I'm here for any questions or discussion you might want to have on this. And real quickly, Mark, before I open up uh, for a discussion, um, I know uh, 23, 24, uh, we should get about $900,000 uh, from the state additional monies. Do you have the forecast for the five years, for the next five years? Did I miss that in your presentation? It's on page 12, 12. slide 12. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Carr. Uh, just another question, Mark. Um, just so I understand, when you talked about if we go back to the original lease amount where they covered 100% of the uh, debt service, you talked, there's a line in there that talks about accrued funding uh, would go back to the, dis the charter schools. What, in, it sounded like a negative in your presentation. Can you explain what that means? All right, so the, uh, the, it, I probably should flip over to these last two pages a little bit about what the capital outlay funds can be used for. They're very restricted as to what they can be used for. Right? So when I say that the funds, the capital funds would accrue to the district, uh, I think first and foremost, the district cannot borrow money uh, without the city council's approval. Uh, they cannot own 
buildings without the city council's approval. Uh, so there's a number of things that the city council has to approve for chapter 26 before they can do something. And so when uh, the capital funds would accrue to the charter school, uh, in effect, they would have very little that they can actually do with them since our lease calls for the city to actually do all the maintenance. And so there's, it, it, it would accrue to them, but they would sit there and do nothing unless it came to the city to do the capital maintenance. Uh, at the same time, uh, so when you have, uh, when you're looking at the, at the statute and exactly what these capital outlay funds can be used for, they can be used to purchase real property. Uh, currently, the, uh, the city would purchase the real property and we would lease it to the charter school. Charter school is not going to own the real property. The uh, charter school or construction of school facilities, again, we could do that. Uh, there was uh, some discussion at the board meeting last night about expanding the charter school system. Uh, I was, uh, Lee County is looking at rebuilding Hector Caffaretta in a new site uh, with a K through eight system uh, with an estimated cost right now of 115 million uh, for an 18, 1800 seat school system. All right, so what that means is, is it, if I were borrowing $115 million, that would come out to, I would, over a 30-year period, I would estimate that that's probably about $5.2 million in debt service on an annual basis for 30 years. Currently, at $1,900 the, per FTE on the capital outlay, and at 1,800 students, that comes in about $3.5 million. So even the capital outlay funding that would come in for that particular school wouldn't pay for that school at least not today. And in the future, it might, but not today. Uh, I believe they will, you know, they'll, I think they're going to be issuing debt for this. Uh, and then, of course, that would have an impact on the overall capital outlay funding. But because uh, the more debt that the school, school system would have, it decreases the amount of the FTE funding that's available to share with charter schools. But be that as it may, that's, it, you know, that's, kind of esoteric in the calculation today. It's, it's really more to do with uh, it, if we were to, what the charter school could actually use this for. So we talked a little bit about uh, purchase, lease purchase or leasing of permanent or relocatable school facilities. Of course, you know, they, again, they could certainly lease a building from us, but if we had to go buy it, I'm not sure that the, the funding today would be, would cover the cost of a new school for us to build a new school. Uh, they, could pers uh, they could also uh, purchase of vehicles to transport students to and from the charter school. I talked a little bit about the, the fact that, you know, the LCI funds can be utilized for the purchasing of the buses. Uh, two years ago, we recommended, because we didn't, this was not on the horizon two years ago with the, with the state legislature, three years ago with the state legislature, and we recommended they get into a revolving leasing program on their buses in order to be able to replace their buses. They had a number of buses that were very old and they needed to be replaced, and, the, and so we entered into leases in order to do that. Uh, renovation, repair, maintenance of the school facilities the charter school owns, purchasing, uh, and that, that the charter school owns or is purchasing through a lease purchase or long-term lease of five years or longer. And so, uh, and, and so in the, our schools right now are not being lease purchased. They're not purchased by the charter school system. Uh, so the, these funds, um, although they can certainly be used for any capital maintenance on them from a lease standpoint, uh, and we would, uh, that's what we would be looking to use them for. <clears throat> Payment of the cost of premiums of the property casualty insurance, I, I noted that they could certainly use those funds for that, and it is included in the, in the proposal that I've put in there. Purchase, lease, purchase, or, uh, or lease of driver education vehicles, motor vehicles, et cetera. Uh, they can do that. Um, these are not buses transporting to and from school, but it's like they have a van that they transport students to and from football games, baseball games, things like that. So uh, that would be available to be able to purchase uh, through, the, through this program. And uh, last but not, and they could also purchase lease purchase or lease of computer devices, software, et cetera, that are, you know, to support the charter school system. Again, we've identified that and what the annual cost associated with that is. And then the payment of the cost of the opening day, opening day collection of Lightberry Media Center for a new school. So uh, none of them are new schools, so that's not something that would be available to them. So in effect, what would be occurring here is that the charter school system would not, would be accruing the funds, but not utilizing it for anything. 
So just just make sure I'm clear on it. So if, if the accrued, if in fact in the future they did accrue capital dollars, it could also be used to offset the capital maintenance fee that we currently absorb. Is that is that a permissible use of the funds if they were to have an accrued number in the future? I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Long. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, uh, I just I had the pleasure of sitting through something similar to this last night, and so I, as the council or as the council liaison to the charter school board, so I figured I'd try to jump ahead of this discussion uh, for some context. Thanks, Mark, as always, uh, for the for the presentation. There's a lot going on here. Is it is it is it fair, I guess, to you to to summarize it and essentially saying that th they didn't have money and we're going to fail, and so we stepped in and and provided them uh, a, an opportunity to to more or less maintain the status quo, and now they do have money. And the question is, do we want to allow them to use that money to go a little bit beyond that, or do we want to take our support back and allow them to, as a net neutral, go back to supporting and maintaining the way that they previously operated? Well, that was they a didn't lot. have money, now they do. Do we yeah. want to do we want I, to continue that? I think them the let idea them use that money is to, to build, or do we want to is to create the net neutral first before we talk about anything else? Sure. With the caveat, I guess that there's some. Um, considerations to be taken on our end with the specificities of the statute and, and, and what they use those funds for and uh, I guess maybe the ownership of, of those said funds. Did you already touch on that a little bit? The ownership of the funds, uh, you know, Not as the an funds, example. But I guess the, the capital that they... If you use the capital funds to purchase something and they happen to go out of business for whatever reason, anything that is used by those funds from a purchase standpoint, an ownership standpoint, would revert to the Lee County School District. So uh, for me, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, the, the program is, is, is great. I think uh, I, we would love to be able to, to give them a little bit more money and see what they do with it. Although I do understand that uh, with the history that you provided that they were supposed to be self-sufficient and this helps uh, get back towards that, that, that main line. Um, I, you know, from the board's standpoint, they of course want us to uh, leave it alone for the time being, uh, allow them an opportunity to, to collect those funds uh, and see what they're able to do with them and, and maybe show that to us again in a year or, or so. Uh, I would be okay uh, putting my council hat back on um, in supporting that. Um, again, we've already kind of forecasted for that as far as maintaining the status quo on our end as far as providing that support. And then it would give us a better idea of what, what they could do uh, with those funds. Um, having said that, though, I, I, I certainly see both sides of this. Um, and so those are just my, my uh, little bit of input, I guess. Thank you. Council Member Hayden. Yeah, to me, it's... Um the bigger, it's the bigger picture with the charter school board, um, the charter school system. We have, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have a thousand kids on the waiting list for the elementaries, the middle, and the high school. Um, that's a lot. There would be no other schools <laughs> probably in the country that has that kind of waiting li list, and that's because of the success of the charter school system. The, it's, uh, you know, one of the top charters in the country. You know, I feel comfortable in, in saying that. So to me, it's, it's not short-term and it's long-term. If we, if we go with anything else other than option A right now, we're setting the school board back or setting the, school, the charter school system back to where it was in the beginning, continuing to struggle. Obviously, for the first two years of this, there are shortfalls um, on that by, by um, giving them back the entire debt service. To me, that's counterproductive to what we were thinking. To me, and I've talked to Jackie Collins about this, you know, I think we need to put a task force together and look at a 10-year plan for our charter school system and where we're gonna be, not only 10, 20, or 30 years, from, uh, but 30 years from now, and what that's gonna mean in terms of space, buildings, maintenance. Um, you know, are there lease options at a place like Victory Park, which is education-centric, to possibly uh, look at moving a high school out there. I think, I think we have to have the ability to look at our options, not continue to saddle the charter school system with continuing problems that they've, that they've faced before. So I think until we're able to see how this, um, how this money um, in the future can help us, you know, I think at least with option A, we, uh, we keep things in place so we can investigate the future of the charter school systems see if we can find a place for every student, you know, which means more funding and, um, 
you know, I, I think for me that's the plan that needs to take place moving forward. Um, for today, for now, let's keep it where it's at, but I think we have to look into our future and where we're taking our charter school systems because of the success rate, success rate that we have. So um, with all that being said, I would be for option A. Thank you. Uh, looks like I'm the next one in line. Um, Mark, if you would go to page uh, 10 uh, in the presentation, and this is for FY23-24, it looks like, uh, about $909,000 in additional income uh, with this uh, LCI. LCI. Um, I guess my first question is, all of the funding, no matter if it's the LCI, PICO, FEFP, that all comes to the city of Cape Coral, correct? It all goes to the charter school system. Does it go to the city of Cape Coral and then we no. allocate it or does it go to the... It goes to the charter school system. Okay. Will the LCI go to the charter school system yes. as well? Yes. Okay. And has. It's already been distributed distributed to them. Yeah, the 909000 Correct. Um, one of the issues that I have, uh, well, first off, let me uh, back up. If you go to page 10, uh, and I know you said page 12, but I think on page 12 you've incorporated the whole big picture. I did. What I am looking for is very similar to page 10, the next five years. Do you have those numbers, 909 being this one, and then for the next five years, do you, do you have those numbers available? 909 first year, uh, just taking and ramping it up on the 20% each year, it would be $1,800,000 in 2025, $2.7 million in 2026. I believe it's uh, 3 point, uh, $3.6 million in 2027, $4.5 million in 2028, and it comes out, to, it'll be about $6 million, $6.5 million when it's all said and done, total. Uh, sorry. When we get to that point, if there's no PICO funding that's associated with it, it would be $6.5 million total by 2028. 10, 13, 14. So you just back that down. But right now, these numbers that here on page 10 assume that the PICO allocation from the state of Florida will continue each year. Right. So we're somewhere between 17, 18 million dollars in revenue over the next five years if you add all that together. And the reason that I, I make that point um, and I think our charter school does a fabulous job. I think if we had additional schools, you could probably put the students in there, but unfortunately that's not the case that, that we have now. And as Mr. Mason even stated, if we built the schools, we still wouldn't have enough money to even pay for them uh, using uh, the LS, LCI uh, monies. You know, one of the things that I'm looking at, you know, we restructured the lease uh, you know, the debt's about three and a half million. We, we uh, brought that down to, uh, or 3.2 million. I think we took that down to about 1.5. Uh, so there's already a reduction on their behalf uh, just with the lease component. And then we stepped up to the plate and we provide uh, IT service, HR service, uh, all the capital maintenance. You know, so not only did we lose that uh, or we incurred that 1.7 million of additional debt service, then we, then we also included all the other services that we are providing for them. And one of the mechanisms that we used in order to do that is the PST as far as the 500 kilowatt reduction. So when you took, take a look at that over the next five years, um, what that funding mechanism would generate, about $13 million over the next five years. You got 2.7, 2.8, 2.8, 2.9, and 3 million. Uh, so you got 13 million that that will generate over here, but if you look at this five year with the LCI, uh, you got somewhere between 17 to 18 million dollars. So what we did to the community is, you know, we took the 500 kilowatt uh, exemption away in order to pay for some maintenance and help the uh, charter schools. I personally believe we have an obligation if there is another funding source, 
that has been made available, which this has, our first obligation is to the community and the residents to, to give them back that 500 kilowatts. That's my position on that. I think there's no detriment to, to the charter school except for maybe future or additional services that they may be able to provide. So I think we have to ask, our question should be, is that the direction that we want to go to, is give them the more the availability to expand or utilize those monies over the next five years, the 17, 18 million dollars, or do we have an obligation to do it at least first to give back the PST uh, monies? For me, that's my vote. I think that we have an obligation to give that back to the community. And now, as you can see, this year, that's not going to uh, really pay for it. It's only uh, 900,000. Next year, it's 1.9, and we're gonna generate uh, 2.8 in uh, revenue uh, for the exemption for next year. So for me, I think we have an obligation to the community and to the residents and the businesses in this community first to give back the PST monies that we've set aside. And I, I kind of see this as, you know, some of us, most of us up here have kids. So if we have, if we have kids and they can't pay their bills and we say, okay, we're gonna help you. But then our kids get a new job and they're making twice as much as they did before or more. Do we still continue to pay their bills? Or do we say, okay, you're making a little more money. So it's your responsibility to pick up what you can. That's kind of how I look at this, you know, to try to dumb this down as much as possible. So that's where I'm at. I think we have an obligation first and foremost with the, uh, with the PST and the exemption. I think we have an obligation to our community since there is an additional funding source available to give that back first uh, and then look at what, what we can do with the monies thereafter. That's, that's where I'm at on this, uh, on this subject. And I, I'm a very strong uh, supporter of, uh, of the charter school, but we have to make the decision what's in the best interest of the community as well. And we've already taken that away from them, that exemption. So now that we have more monies that's come up that we weren't expecting, the first thing that we should be doing is giving that money back. Council Member Steinke. Thank you. I feel similarly about the uh, about the PST and giving that back in light of a, 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 a different funding source. Um, and I kind of look at it uh, similarly to my kids too. I love my kids a lot, but I also feel they got to be responsible for their their own stuff as, as well. So, um, a question that I had, Mark, is on on your slide number twelve. I'm wondering, with the with the magic of of spreadsheets, when we look at uh, the different options that we have, that chart on 12 uh, represents option A. Represents option B. Um, at the top of uh, the, the chart, it says expected amount in excess of expected funding for next four years, assuming no change and no contributions from the city. Correct. And so option A is no change? No, no, option A is it, it, from the city. I'm talking about in this particular case, assuming that the PSD funding didn't exist. That's the contribution from the city, $2.6 million a year right now. I see. Uh, towards, you know, maintaining the charter school system where they are today. Okay. And so option, so option B leaves us, leaves us in the position of what's represented by slide 12. Correct. Okay. Then likely, uh, likely I would be, I would be, uh, I would be in favor of giving the PST back to the that back to the citizens and using the funding source and allowing you know if, if they can't use uh, if the funding source can only be used for certain things then let's let that funding source be used to pay those certain things um, and if we look to increase the number of charter schools facilities that we have out 
um, we, we can look at that at, at that time. If that's two years from now, five years from now, whenever, whenever that happens, we, we certainly can be prepared to cross that bridge when we come to it. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's give the citizens their money in lieu of this new source. That's where I think I stand. Okay, Council Member Welsh. Thank you. Um, I, I tend to agree um, with what the mayor and council members think he said. Uh, the very first thing I would like to do is give the 500 kilowatt hours back to all the residents. Um, I know um, in the four years I've been up here, the first two years was trying to fix a problem that we had. And um, those are some of the solutions we came up with. And now, um, now that that problem has been fixed and there is more funding, certainly I would like to give back to the residents, uh, number one. I also, though, uh, can see and appreciate the point where Councilmember Long says uh, we need to just kind of see how this goes a little bit, too, because uh, we certainly don't want to throw out a, a carpet and then as soon as you take two steps on it, we rip it out from underneath them. So um, I, could, I could certainly support the 500 kilowatt hour reduction, um, and I could support either option uh, at that point. Can we still do option one? But have the 500 kilowatt hour there? What, what does that look like, Mark? If, because I know sure you're saying I understand that, the question. that this table is option two, but if we kept it as option one, does that just mean that all that, all those numbers would increase by that? <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand. You're, the you're saying that this represents option number two. It does. Which option number two, does that, Hold on. This is the one that's up there right now on page six. That's current. Okay. That would mean that, you know, we're not talking about any LCI funds coming in for anything. It just, it would, you know, status quo. PSD stays in place, uh, you know, or you don't use it for something else or, uh, but that's basically what it would be. Uh, so when you come back over here to on page 12, uh, this assumes that the LCI uh, replaces the PST, essentially. First two years, uh, you know, the, the PST would stay in place for 25 and 26 because we're not at 100% or even 80% of the total amount of the LCI that would come into the system. Uh, so the, you know, in order to continue to maintain the, the facilities out there. Okay. Um. Again, I, I would support uh, giving the 500 kilowatt hours back to the residents and um, seeing what goes from there. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Long, Council Member Shepard hasn't spoken, so I'll go to him and then back to you. Appreciate that. Council Member Shepard. Yeah, I will be voting to give back to the citizens. They were there for when the need was there, and, and I, I think it's time to give back. Thank you. Council Member Long. Mark, can we even... Um, give back the exemption, so to speak? I mean, was that something that we removed from LCI? I remember at the time when it was presented, LCC had made their, their presentation that we were the last remaining municipality to not have removed that in some way, shape, or form. Um, and we did, the exemption. Are we able to give that back? Uh, if the city council adopts an ordinance putting it back in place six months from now, that's what would happen, yes. Okay. Yeah, and then just additional context, I guess. Um, again, I haven't sat through the meetings of the Charter School Board, and we talked about it a little bit at the budget. I believe one of the teachers showed up. Um, is the, the, the ability that this may provide by freeing up capital that they're using now um, that they could otherwise use for uh, paying the educators and the support staff? I think this year they, they budgeted because they were only able to budget 1% raise, um, just to give context in all the discussions that we're having with the unions, et cetera, as far as the raises that they were getting. Um, that would go triple that and still aren't enough. So, uh, you know, it's important, I think, to support the school. There's ways that, uh, that a, uh, an outperforming, and it is an outperforming um, academic institution, uh, benefits the residents uh, in general. Property taxes, et cetera, aren't necessarily quantifiable, but I think they certainly would equate to whatever the, the, the PST money, I think $20 a year it came out to at the time, or $27, um, uh, makes up for. So. Uh, again, uh, that would be my position. I just wanted to give that uh, additional context that this would free up um, some funds for them to be able to support that staff and continue to provide uh, what I think is an outstanding um, program. Thank you. 
Yeah, one last comment from me is uh, if we go down the path of the PST, and I understand it may be a couple years before that's 100% uh, will cover, I think we need to prorate it in the, in the process. So if we're getting 900 this year, 1.9 next year, uh, and however that goes, we need to prorate that. So if we have to, if we have to implement that over a three-year period, and then after three years, it's 100% of a 500 kilowatt uh, exemption, then to me, that's how we do it. Um, so we make sure we give it back. Might not be able to give it all back at first, but kind of prorate it as, as we go through the process. Uh, Council Member Steinke. Thank you, that was gonna be my exact comment, was it, I would think that the 500 kilowatt hour wouldn't have to be all or nothing. Right. And so, and so maybe we take a look. If, if there is the need for uh, additional uh, funding in the cash flow uh, of the charter school systems to uh, get the teachers where they need to be compensation wise, maybe we take a look at what that, what, what that uh, is gonna take. Uh, and so in, instead of um, you know, giving all 500 back, we give 200 back this year. We give 200 back you know, a year or two later. Obviously some math has to be done, I would think, on that. But nonetheless, I wouldn't, if it didn't have to be all or nothing, I'd say let's take a look at what it, what it could be in a staged way uh, to try to accomplish as many objectives as we can. Yeah, we, we can certainly do that research for you as to whether that's possible or not. Okay. All right, Council Member Hayden. Mark, Council Member Long mentioned about a $27 to the consumer on the PS. Is that about right? Is that about what the average was back then? Uh, that's what it was. LCEC changed their, their rates uh, beginning in January of this year. Right. Actually, the dollar value is, is a little bit higher on the first bill. Right. First that, 500 was, kilowatt hours than what was originally identified uh, in the beginning. But that was $27 so we, a year, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's what it was then. It's a little higher now. Yeah, and I remember conversations when we talked about this at $27 a year, and, um, and you have to look at the meaning of that. You're putting a tremendous burden on the charter school system by they're looking at a $2 million shortfall the first two years if uh, we give them back the debt. Uh, uh, actually, they're not. Your, your sheet on page oh, no, 12 no, they're not. No, there's no shortfall for the charter school system. The shortfall is on our side, not their side. Since we pay for the, since we pay for the capital maintenance, we pay for everything that's associated with the charter schools. We keep them, you know, the, the, the goal at the time was education, all the back office and everything else on this side. So that's what's happening. I, there is no shortfall for them. As a matter of fact, so the LCI take, funds. If they take back $1.5 million in debt, there's not going to be a shortfall to the charter school system? No. There's not. It, if the, again, in the, in the beginning, there's a, there's a trade-off you continually utilize in the PST. By the time you get into year four, 100% of their capital, annual IT-related capital costs are fully funded, uh, as is their property casualty insurance. If there were any buses that needed to be purchased by that time, it would be fully funded. Right now, those, none of those numbers are fully right. funded. So when you said there would I'm be saying. a shortfall the first two years, what did you mean? The shortfall is on our side, on the net available for capital. It's on our side, not, not on the charter school side. Charter school side, actually, by taking advantage of the LCI funds that come in first and applies them to these three items that are allowable by law actually supports them and gives them additional funding that they didn't have before, which allows them then to apply that potentially towards teacher, teacher salaries, teacher raises. It, it allows them to restructure a little bit on the, on the teacher side that they, that they simply cannot do today. So then, then how do we make up the shortfall? In the first couple of years, it would, you'd still continue to use the PST funding, but by the time you get into 27, you're, there is no shortfall. So if we give back the PST funding now back to the, back to the resident, then how do we make up the shortfall? Well, that you don't. Okay. <laughs> that shortfall wouldn't, would, it wouldn't be available. And I think, 
I think what the mayor just said, maybe we don't do it right up front, but you know, the, the, this is a timing issue. We're on a 20%, 20%, 20% issue that the state has put in place on the funding. So we would still need to be able to keep that resource in place in order to maintain the, the school system and do everything that needs to be done. So giving the charter school system back the debt, um, they can't use this funding from the state to cover that debt, correct? It, it, that is what's being used to cover the debt. We are. But this new funding that's coming in can only be used for uh, new schools, lease purchase, whatever it might be. Could they, can they take this extra funding or to take care facilities. of the $1.5 million that we're giving them back in debt? Yes. They can use it for that. For leasing so, the facilities, yes. So for the next couple years, that pretty much will use up that funding, correct? Certain, yes, a certain portion of it, yes. Okay. So there really wouldn't be any funding available to reassess teachers based on those first two years. All right, so let's let, let's go back to this you, slide right You don't right need here. to go back. I'm okay, just, I mean, I can, I can just a, walk them through with you. They're the answer is, is they can. Yeah. If you if the city is going to if they are if they're utilizing these LCI funds up front for the purpose to which they are they are associated with, then those funds would be available for the for reassessing teacher salaries, et cetera. It would be. Because now the FEFP is not being used to pay for the property and casualty insurance, the IT related capital costs, et cetera, which they well, currently I'm, are. I'm not gonna continue to belabor this, but the, you know, they're still gonna have additional debt. They just are. Yeah, they had it and we took it away and now they now we're gonna it give would it be back. back. So. It would be back, yes. Yeah. So it, to me it, yes. it doesn't you know, the extra funding to me doesn't put them in any better position than they are right now if we take the um, if we take the PST back. That that's my only point. Okay. Thanks, Mayor. Council Member Welsh. Yeah. Um, I could certainly support a phased approach to the uh, kilowatt hour exemption, kind of to bring back what I said before, I don't want to rip the carpet out from underneath them. So if it looks like in this slide that it's going to take two or three years, then if, if that's what it takes for us to get that from what it is back down to uh, zero, then uh, I can certainly support that phased approach. Thank you. Mr. Mason, it sounds like uh, you, uh, and Madam Assistant City Manager, it looks like you got a, a consensus of the direction that Council would like to go in. Um, do you feel a need to bring back any other information at a future Cal meeting? Um, uh, or do you have the information that you're looking for? I think there's some things that we'll need to discuss with you regarding the PST, but uh, beyond that, it might not need to be at a Cal meeting. We'll have individual discussions with you on it. Okay. Uh, Council Member Long. Mr. Mason, just to kind of muddy the water up even further, can you explain a little bit about what this might also mean, uh, or maybe it's a different discussion for a different meeting with regards to um, the uh, ball field the, that we had proposed building for them on however these taxes the might... Community athletic field? Yes, and that these capital funds might be used to uh, facilitate that and build that program? Uh, I believe that... Rather than the, the taxpayer, which would save them a heck of a lot more than... $27. In this particular circumstance, you could, uh, if the city built the, the uh, athletic fields uh, and leased them to the, to the charter school, they would be paying the, for the athletic fields through the lease as well through these funds. I believe that can be done. If the city built it. If the city built right. it. But the charter they, school so built Theoretically, the, if they received these funds, they could use them towards that capital improvement? They could. And they could build it. At some point in time the city in the future, have to spend the eight million plus dollars that we've projected. Yes. Thank you. Theoretically, they can. Councilmember Cosby. But if that happened, <clears throat> would it then be a public facility, or would it be a charter school facility? Charter school facility. Thank you. Cool. Which then alleviates the issues that we've brought up at the last meeting about sharing the facility and the scheduling of the school and the public, et cetera. Just for context. Public right. could use it, or public could not use it if it was a charter school facility. Uh, they would be the ones to manage the, the use of the facility. Council Member Hayden. Mayor, um, I know you said you thought you had consensus 
I would appreciate going down the line on the options. On the PST uh, or the three options? On the on the three options, since that was the. And I guess before we do that, I have no problem. Yeah, no problem yeah, doing. I'm not. You, you know, it sounded like there was consensus, but I'm not sure that there was. Okay. Uh, the PST discussion, uh, Mr. Mason, would you uh, put that in a category of B or C in your options? Because B doesn't really reflect the PST option. So, you know, for me, I can, when I look at the three options, because we brought up the argument about the PST, that almost takes us to the C option because B doesn't really reflect that. In your presentation, is that it, it would that doesn't. be an accurate statement? The uh, it doesn't. Uh, if you were it, A is status quo, B reflects a uh, a reversion back to the uh, the original lease, to where the charter school systems would pay the original debt service associated with the four schools that they're using. Uh, currently, the PST was uh, put out there uh, for the reduction of the kil 500 kilowatt hours in order to pick up. 53% of the cost of that debt service, uh, as well as the capital maintenance of the facilities. And so uh, with B, if you know we went down that road with B, you would still need the PST for the first couple of years. Uh, and then uh, you know, if it was the city council's election to repeal it and, get, and put it back uh, in place, then you know, that would be in 2027. Now, it's not written into option B, but that would be the, uh, the substance of option B. So could you put those three choices on the, on the screen for us, please? So for me, with that being said, because that's exactly how I saw option B, my choice would be C, look at alternative services delivery, delivery for the charter schools, because it, the PST is not reflective in option B how we discussed it here today. So my choice with that being said would be C with the understanding that like you had mentioned, you would be coming back to us either one-on-one -on -one in our future Cal to show us exactly what that looks like. All right, so we'll start with uh, council member Cosden. C. 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 A. Um, if it's A, B or C, I, I'm kind of I, I want to say A, but also with some sort of PST reduction as a possibility. So that would be C. <laughs> so then C, but knowing that A is, is kind of where I want it to be. I don't want to move saying C moving towards B. So uh, C, but you know, let's keep the lease the way it is and see if we can reduce the PST. So you're picking C? C. I think you modified the C. C with extra, yeah. Like a, like a, a C plus. Like a C, yeah. C plus, which, you know, I guess if, since we're talking schools, isn't it's still a passing grade there. A, a for me. C. Okay. Get to direction uh, you're looking for, Madam Assistant City Manager. Okay. All righty. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, we've been here about two hours. Why don't we uh, take a break until 11.15?
right, I'd like to call the meeting uh, back to order. Uh, item 4B5 is hurricane uh, recovery update. Uh, Chief Lamb. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Ryan Lamb, Fire Chief and Emergency Management Director. We have a few things to discuss. It's been a little while since we've talked about some of the uh, details of hurricane recovery that we've got going on, and we've got some updates on some things that are currently happening. So to talk a little bit uh, today, we're going to cover public assistance, then we're going to get into the hazard mitigation grant program, the CDBGDR uh, process, quite a bit of detail there, and then touch quickly on the Cape Coral Recovery and Resilience Plan that's currently being worked on. So Mark Mason, Financial Services Director. So a little update on the public assistance. Uh, currently we have uh, 92 total po project worksheets uh, that, are, uh, that have been created with a potential reimbursable value of a little over $109.7 million. We have 56 PWs that have been uh, submitted to FEMA for review. Uh, they're in their Central Resource Center, uh, totaling approximately $72 million. 36 of those are under development by staff. Uh, at $36 million, 17 projects have been obligated for a total of, of $27 million with 14 projects that have been paid by FEMA FDM, uh, cash receipts totaling $27 million. And just a reminder to everybody that, uh, you know, as part of the programming uh, by the state uh, earlier or late last year, very soon after the hurricane, uh, they'll be picking up our 5% for the majority of these projects. So uh, there will be very little out-of-pocket costs for us uh, for these particular uh, projects. But nevertheless, we still have to do them in order to get reimbursed back for them. Uh, 37 of our turnkey projects, and these are turnkey projects by our insurance company, uh, have been completed. Uh, so the permanent work associated with those projects uh, were, are done. Uh, we're talking about a lot of buildings, uh, roof replacements. Uh, we replace them with metal roofs. Uh, we're looking at trying to get those mitigated through FEMA, but that may or may not happen. Um, so total funding for that, for the uh, turnkey projects, was $3.9 million for our insurance company. Uh, we will, uh, we pick up the deductibles. We'll be submitting the deductibles to, uh, for reimbursement through FEMA. And uh, we also did receive the $51 million zero interest loan uh, through the Florida Div uh, Div Division of Emergency Management. We have refunded ourselves currently for uh, much of the out uh, debris work that, was, that, uh, that we've paid for. Uh, the, and as we receive funding back from FEMA uh, for that debris, it will go back, uh, we'll, re we'll reimburse the state back for the $51 million. And then when it's all said and done, if there's anything left over, we'll provide that back to the state with interest. And that's an update on public assistance. All right, hazard mitigation grants. Um, and Mr. Mayor, at your discretion, I'm okay with questions or discussion along the way if, if that's uh, needed. Um, so currently for the hazard mitigation grants um, related back to Hurricane Ian specifically, we have 20 projects currently that we have submitted um, for roughly $162 million is what uh, our current um, list of funding requests are through that program. Uh, we expect awards to start coming in this month to next month. We are continue to get requests for information, which is good because that means they're reviewing our, our items um, and looking through those. Um, right now it is a 75% covered by the grant, 25% local cost share. There is something through the ENCDBGR, which is called Global Match, which would potentially absorb that 25% for us. Um, one of the big projects that we're looking at is some generators for lift stations, which is a, this is an example picture, not a, a current one, but an example picture that exists of one of the projects, but um, that was a, I think a $100 million project that we're near getting uh, for our, our community. Um, and then there's other HMGP a notice of funding availability that are out there. So Hurricane Adelia, Broward Flood. So once they kind of cover those immediately affected areas, they broaden those out. So we have other applications in continuously for other um, hazard mitigation grant funding uh, opportunities. Again, this is the, uh, the list here of the projects we have for Hurricane um, Ian. Uh, the ones in the, the light shaded blue are the ones that we're looking at for um, what we call the global match if they potentially affect that low moderate income area. I'm so sorry, that 28 million for those critical lift station generators is one of them. Um, 
I can run down this list, but that's a, that's a key one uh, that we're looking at. The other one that's highlighted in, there in blue would be hardening of a fire station, but we're also splitting off the Lake Kennedy Center and Special Population Center because they uh, directly affect a limited clientele that's uh, permissible under CDBGDR. One of the other projects that's listed on here is um, some hardening here for the police department headquarters, uh, some of the expansion work possibly at the EOC, and also hardening of City Hall. So talking about CDBGDR, uh, obviously this is um, again HUD money from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development that was given to Lee County at $1.1 billion. So a couple of the programs that are listed, Lee Cares, we'll touch on that again here briefly. Then there's a notice of funding availability for these key areas that are planning, multifamily rehab, public facilities, critical infrastructure, multifamily housing development, and then single family housing development. And then there's also the evaluation committees. Um, council has appointed John Bashaw and has been accepted and is functioning in that role and been very uh, happy to work with John in his work on that committee. And then there's currently a need for uh, naming somebody to the housing evaluation committee. So talking about Lee Cares, um, so there's about $175 million that are set aside for the Lee Cares process. So the money here is used in three areas, working right to left. The first is, um, again, from that right-hand side, voluntary acquisition. So this would be if somebody's house continuously floods, um, they could sell their property to um, FEMA and it could get wiped out and would be continuous green space. It can't ever be developed back into anything into the future. It could just function as open parkland. The next one is housing um, purchase assistance. Again, outside of that special, special flood hazard area could be an opportunity for individuals that are low moderate income to as, assist them in purchasing a property. And then the last one is the rehabilitation, reconstruction and elevation. So there's funding that uh, is out there for rehabilitating homes, reconstructing or elevating homes that are affected, uh, again, for those that are income qualified um, in this area. So the next is the notice of funding availability, and, and I apologize for the small print, but just to make sure uh, we get through what, what's going on here. So our applications are in and closed for planning. Um, the multifamily process is in and closed. We are currently in the process right now for public facilities and critical infrastructure, and we are waiting the, um, well, I believe they've just been opened up here, the notice of funding availability for um, multi family housing development and single family housing development. So the recovery and resilience planning. So the city of Cape Coral submitted uh, the following projects. The North <laughs> Cape Coral drainage basin alternative restoration plan at 2.5 million. Disaster and cost recovery plan at 400,000. A communications plan at 300,000. So this covers um, not only communication from the city out to the community would also cover some of our essential communication amongst uh, staff working before, during, and after a disaster event. The Cape Coral Parkway Cor Corridor Resiliency Planning Study at 500,000, and then a business continuity uh, and resilience plan at $300,000 for a total of $4.1 million. Uh, an update on this is. Um, all of our projects scored over the minimum threshold and there are sufficient funds that have been identified within the planning and we have tentatively been awarded all five of these projects uh, pending uh, approval from the Lee County Board of County Commission. We have a meeting set up I believe next week to begin that subrecipient grant process and the, the agreements and the, the requirements of receiving this funding. So that's good news. <coughs> Multifamily rehabilitation. Um, Chief, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Mayor, is it, uh, just quickly on that, it, uh, did we only submit five? I mean, did we get everything we, we asked for, basically? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, one of the questions, um, there was 25 million, but 21 million was released as part of this notice of funding availability. I believe there was about $7 million left on the table um, through that. Uh, and the, I believe what the committee is going to, or the county is going to look to do is apply that to infrastructure or critical uh, facilities. I believe we're gonna be underfunded significantly in those areas. So multifamily rehabilitation. Um, 
So the, the city doesn't you know, directly um, own or, or operate any multifamily rental property. So what we did is we have a list of all of those in the city. And in January of 2024, the, the, we sent out a letter to all of those uh, property owners, encouraging them to participate, providing some of the ideas of eligible activities, and basically uh, offering a letter of support. So again, we informed them of the NOFA and the program, strongly encouraged them to apply, and offered even a letter of support from the city um, if they chose to pursue that. All right, uh, public facilities. Uh, so this program is designed to provide resilient construction and re rehabilitate public facilities. It has to meet a HUD national objective, and it has to have a Hurricane Ian tieback. So those are kind of some of the, roughly some of the rules of the game. There's $100 million in funding that's uh, allotted here, and again, this is across all of Lee County. There's a $5 million minimum and a $50 million maximum. Right now, we are proposing four projects at $81 million. So these are the four projects that we are proposing under public facilities. So the first is a shelter um, that would be its, its function during a gray sky um, system. So 90,000 square feet. The calculation is 20 square feet per person for a hurricane shelter. So this would shelter approximately 4,500 people during uh, an event. It would also be pet friendly. All of our, our shelters are pet friendly. And then during blue skies, this would serve as a recreation center and also be a resilience hub for community. So we talked about community meetings. If you wanted to have uh, ways that, and classes and programming that would help uh, those that are low moderate income in, increase their employment opportunities, this would be the kind of stuff that would happen out of that location. But a very large facility and the cost uh, there reflects that. South Cape Mobility Hub. So this is working um, with our traffic group and uh, Lee Tran to redo some um, traffic and mobility opportunities within South Cape. The next one would be two substations for the police department in um, the northeast and northwest. Uh, there's some special exceptions for uh, the police department to be able to, to, to do this and service particularly some of those low moderate income areas or census tracts that we have in those areas. And then lastly is the Cape Coral um, nonprofit capital program. So within this, we actually had a meeting yesterday. Um, we invited um, all of our nonprofit groups from across the city to come together and provide um, some of their input on potential projects. Essentially, I don't think any of them were gonna have one project that was gonna exceed that 5 million, but what we were looking to do was potentially get five to 10 of those specific projects amass that dollar value over five million, the county would give us the five million and then we would sub uh, out those additional projects below. So that's kind of what that process is. Chief, quick uh, question. Sir. Uh, if my addition is correct, this goes over the max limit allowable? Um, so this, there's a hundred million dollars available uh, for the entire county. There's per project, it has per to reach project. a five million and a maximum of 500, I'm sorry, 50 million uh, per the, for that uh, per project basis. So we have four projects, $81 million. Again, we're just one part of Lee County, so I don't think we're, we're gonna get all of these, um, but we're going to uh, help show that need. Hopefully there can be some reallocation of funding into the future. Have we prioritized that list that you just went through? Is that the list in order that you've given priority to? No, I don't believe this is the prioritized list. The shelter from the pre previous conversations we've had, uh, the shelter has been a very high priority um, through that process. Um, the other parts might be a little more malleable, and some of these have come up more recently. The police substations are ones that, um, based off of some of the um, reading into the details of the funding availability, that was one that now presented as an option uh, that maybe is going to be a more viable project than initially we thought. Thank you. Critical infrastructure. So similar, um, we're talking about building resilient um, critical facilities and infrastructure um, or rehabbing them. Uh, again, it must meet a HUD national objective and has to have a Hurricane Ian tieback. Again, $5 million minimum, $50 million maximum per project, but there's $129 million across all of Lee County for these projects. Right now we are proposing uh, actually, it's, I believe it's going to be four projects for um, 
$110 million. So the first one here is going to be a emergency well and RO system for Central City facilities. So again, keeping water running um, at the EOC and police headquarters, actually City Hall would have to come off of this list. I apologize, this is, you know, it's evolving as we continue to work with our technical advisors on this. Weir rehabilitation, again, we're particularly looking at weirs um, that have flood control opportunities for those that service low moderate income areas. And then UEP mainline development, um, again, particularly looking at areas that service those low moderate income areas. Um, and why I say we, this one might get split is in conversations with uh, our county partners. Um, we'll submit one project specifically for potable water. We're gonna submit a different one um, for sewer lines. And those would be the main lines um, that, that go in or the primary distribution lines. I'm not sure of the technical terms, but not the laterals that go off and service the individual properties. Um, we're having conversations about those individual um, laterals and switchover being um, eligible under the Lee Cares individual housing thing that I talked about in the beginning. So those are the, the three slash four programs that we're looking to apply for here in this critical infrastructure area. Sir. So we're looking at, at everything. And this part of the resilience plan that I'm gonna talk a little bit at the end is new funding opportunities are popping up continuously and they all have kind of different rules that go along with them. So the HMGP projects that we talked about kind of at the beginning, they're run through the county to the state to the Fed up through FEMA. The CDBGR ones are run through the county to HUD. So different programs, different groups, but yeah, we're gonna, we wanna come up with a list of, of projects and priorities and continue to seek all of the different ways that we can get that funding. So the $950 million the state made available, um, we're looking at what's the requirements of that, what's the, the rule, so to speak, of what's eligible, and then looking for every opportunity uh, and kind of having a pre-set list of projects that no matter what funding opportunity comes up, we can look at seeing what we can apply for. Multifamily housing, uh, again, the city doesn't plan to do any multifamily housing, um, so we don't plan to put in a direct application for this, but if we do have any uh, developers who do put in for any of these here in the city, we'll work with them like we will for any other developer. Amy. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members. For the record, Amy with the City Planning Division. I'm gonna talk about a NOFA that's currently open. Um, we're gonna, hoping to gauge your interest in this particular program. Um, the current NOFA is the Single Family Housing Development Program. Um, the application process is open to general local government, public housing authorities, nonprofits, or for profit developers. There's 50 million available. Uh, the minimum number of units that can be constructed is 10, minimum award 3 million, maximum award 20 million, and the maximum subsidy per unit is about 300,000. So there's two project models uh, within the NOFA. The first is new construction of single family subdivisions, and the second uh, is infill and scattered site development. Uh, these projects must incorporate hazard mitigation measures and green building standards and have to comply with the CDBG DR affordable single family program guidelines that are published on the county's website. So more information on the single family housing development program, um, they must be taken undertaken within Lee County, Florida, of course. Uh, housing activities that are eligible are the acquisition and development of single family housing for home ownership. Again, minimum of 10 new single family housing units and new construction of single family housing units. Item three shows a list of eligible costs that are reimbursable under this program. 
So we have an opportunity to talk about uh, a city application for the development of single scattered site single family homes. These would be available to persons that are below 80% the area median income. Uh, we would target the use potentially of city owned residential lots that are in, within our surplus property uh, list. Um, and we have an opportunity to provide leverage our hurricane housing recovery program unprogrammed unpro funding to add additional money to the development of these housing. Currently, we have about 2.5 million in unprogrammed HHRP funding. So th that is kind of what we're looking for direction. Is this something that we're interested in potentially putting an application in? Are we going to lean towards the nonprofit sector, the private sector to do this? Um, historically, um, the city has worked very closely with small nonprofits to um, work kind of hand in hand to develop these programs since um, probably the early 90s. Uh, right now, our major partners, Habitat for Humanity of Lee and Hendry, I anticipate them coming in with their own application. But we do have an opportunity as a local government to do this. So we wanted to put it on the table, engage your interest. Do you know how many uh, lots we have, city and lots in the city? Not off the top of my head. Um, I have the list, but I haven't combed through it yet. I know that right now on our surplus list that is earmarked for affordable housing, it's 12. Um, but we would look to expand it. We have a very narrow uh, criteria for that particular program. We would look to expand our criteria north. Most of the time we concentrate kind of south, but we would look to expand some of the single family scattered lots to the north as well. Yeah, and also it does have to be out of a special flood hazard area. So that push pushes us north. So I've got a few more things to talk about, but I think that we were just trying to gauge an interest from uh, council on this area. We can talk about this at the end of, before we start working on an application for submittal, if this would be something that council would have an, an interest in pursuing. Um, the evaluation committee, uh, again, I want to again publicly thank John Bashall for his work and efforts uh, in the planning and infrastructure um, evaluation committee. Um, looking at the affordable housing development evaluation committee, uh, Lee County passed the, a resolution that defines that. They also went ahead and um, named the five voting members within that resolution. Um, there are six non-voting members, uh, one from each municipality. The five um, and then one non-voting member from each uh, county commissioner. Uh, they've specified no elected officials, uh, but we did um, get clarification uh, that a city employee could participate on it and that our submission of a application for funding would not be construed as a conflict of interest. So we would like to uh, look at that. There is an application due date of May 24th that we would look to. Um, we have to get that into the county before that date. And then again, just to wrap up um, this recovery plan, um, as we as we spoke about, you might have seen the the seven or eight projects that we're talking about for planning and uh, or critical infrastructure and public facilities. There was twice as many projects that city staff brought forward of ideas and things that we would like to see done that didn't qualify um, for those eligible activities under those grant programs. And so that's where we're looking at the, the scopes of work of those different projects that we have, all of the different funding sources that are available, pushing out timelines and trying to maximize out that, the funding opportunities that we can to get these important projects done. But it's about uh, also about making sure that we fit within whatever those um, eligibility requirements are for each of those grant functions. That's what I have. All right, <clears throat> thank you. So uh, I guess first uh, item, and it sounds like you need some direction on for sure, uh, well, two, two different items. Uh, the affordable housing committee person, I know you have to, uh, what was that, May 24th, I believe, you have to appoint someone. Do you have a recommendation on that? Uh, how that process will work moving forward, and I guess initially it'll come before council uh, for approval. Is that is that a correct uh, statement? If we work it the same way we did for the um, planning and infrastructure, um, I believe looking at this one, uh, I have a personal recommendation, and that we have a subject matter expert on staff um, 
Amy, that is uh, very versed in this topic and I believe would represent the city well, but I would, we would defer to the will of council. I know in the previous committee, we weren't allowed to utilize a staff member, but this committee we can? Yes, sir. Right. My recommendation would be Amy to, you know, just because of her background. So why don't we uh, have a discussion on that topic and try to give them uh, direction here, Council Member Welsh. Yeah, knowing that we can have a staff member, uh, Amy is is by far the most, uh, I feel, the most qualified uh, to represent the city in that manner. So I would also support her in that position. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Carr. Yeah, obviously, I would support Amy as well, but I'd like to, you know, get her agreement to that, I guess, or. You know, maybe she has another suggestion, if not her, uh, maybe Mike can weigh in on that. But if she has the time or maybe if she has a suggestion for another staff member that may have more time and similar knowledge, you know, I'm open to that idea as well. But I support Amy if, if, if she'd like to, if that's good for her. She's on board. <laughs> <laughs> Whether she likes it or not, right? <laughs> Ball and told. No, no, she... Yeah, <laughs> we've had some conversations and, and, you know, when you're in a group of people that are talking on a whole nother level uh, of, of expertise and, and she is certainly in that class of truly a subject matter expert, even with people that do this full time. So she is a, in a class of our own. Okay. Everybody okay with uh, Amy being that individual? Okay. Um, that takes care of that issue. I guess let's go to the... Uh, the $50 million uh, affordable housing initiative. It looked like we had a couple uh, options there. Can you maybe put that back up on the screen? So there are two types of programs, project models. Um, the one is the single family subdivision and the second is the infill and scattered site development. That is the one that we would look towards, uh, be, mostly because we don't have any large tracts of land to develop. Uh, as a subdivision and also it uh, is in line with our policies um, with regards to our location of our affordable housing and not, not concentrating and using a scattered site approach throughout the city. So what we were looking at is a single family scattered site program. Um, while I touched on this before, while we in the past have not served as the developer, it's not unusual for local governments to do so. Um, and in the programs we've run in the past, and actually the house to the right is one that was built on a, on a house, on one of the city's um, surplus land properties. Um, city staff basically served as the, um, the mastermind behind the program. So we do have the ability to kind of, we know how to set these programs up. Um, we know what we need to do to bid them. We know how we have to spec them out, what our requirements would be under uh, the CDB re re regulations. We have intake specialists on staff. So these are things that we can do. It's just kind of a departure from our typical model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know that we've had uh, success in partnering with our nonprofits uh, over many, many years. And since they, uh, you know, have that expertise, uh, and we, we do have that great working relationship. Uh, for me, uh, I do uh, agree to the infill type approach, uh, since we don't, you know, have, have since we're a, a pre flatted community, I think that's the best approach. Um, you know, unless you can tell us otherwise that that's not a good direction to go to, you know, because it, it is a program that we've been utilizing for many years it's, uh, it has worked and worked well, uh, unless, unless you have an opinion that we should go in a different direction. I don't necessarily have an opinion that we go in a different direction. It would probably just be an additional direction, right? We know that either way, Habitat more than likely will be at the table. This would just be an additional program. Um, traditionally, we had gone, had two different sets of buyers between our, we had two nonprofit, um, developers. One kind of got a higher low income and one had a lower, but everything's kind of evened out nowadays. Um, so there, we're all hitting the same mm -hmm. income strata. And the last question that I have is, would it be beneficial to develop a program and the criteria that you just mentioned and be able to utilize any particular uh, developer or builder that wanted to, to 
participate in that program. Would that be an advantage? So it's solely just not one entity? Um, yeah, the, I think there's always um, some benefit to having multiple um, products at the, you know, that are available to our clientele. Um, you know, you, some builders have their own model. Um, in the past, we've had two or three different models where we've partnered with different builders, um, give people kind of the idea of having their own selection process uh, as, as part of buying their own home instead of saying, this is your house. And mm -hmm. so. well, well, was it your thought that we would develop that criteria and what they would need to meet and how that project goes? Not necessarily for us, the city being the developer, but here's the program, here's the criteria that you meet, you apply if you want to participate, and then we would grant that. Is that, is that a process that you're contemplating? That is something we could look at. Are we able to subgrantee? I'm just trying to figure out what the ask is here. Yeah. Well, we can do it ourselves, right, as we serve as a developer, or potentially we can go out and say, uh, we are looking for a partner to come in and do this program with us. If that's the case, for me personally, I think I would lean more towards that. The city develops the criteria that no matter who the builder or developer is, they have to meet that criteria. Uh, it may be better because you have a, a wider range of contractors that you can utilize, um, but we would still regulate it in such a way where they have to meet the criteria. I'm not necessarily interested in, in the city being a developer, but I think that way we can kind of control where it is, how it's being built, and we're kind of like the project manager more so. Mm -hmm. My recommendation, if going that direction, would be that we maintain some control on client eligibility in the, in the end t part of it, because that's the most important part, is making sure that the people that you're putting in the housing is eligible under the federal regulation. Yeah, so um, there could be so, some sort of partnership there. Okay. Council members, thank you. Thank you. I had a couple of questions and, and a couple of comments. I know uh, with Habitat for Humanity, the, the uh, recipients participate in the mm -hmm. We gener generally, when we partner with people, don't dictate their models. So for Habitat, it, you know, to participate in our programs, Habitat has to meet our requirements, but we also recognize that um, service is part of there, so they require it. For um, our other agencies that we've worked with in the past, it has been like we need our clients to um, come to the table with their down payments, which we also set for Habitat clients, um, as well as um, being able to get financing. So um, that is kind of how we would look at it. That answers your question, which I don't know if it did. <laughs> It, it, not that, not that yeah. it would be more than maybe another house or two maybe, yeah. but not a major effect, but just the, the thought of the, the way this Habitat program works. Yeah. Habitat's a well-oiled machine with volunteer um, participation. It would be it would be hard to scale that, in my opinion, to a, a normal developer. Um, I think by having um, your down payment requirements and thing and your required um, homeownership counseling, I think that is sufficient um, in ensuring people's buy-in in the property. And then uh, other uh, institutions, if you will, like, like Builders Care and, and whatnot, they're readily involved in, in that type of work and assisting people you know, get into homes. Most often it would have been repair and uh, um, staying in a home that they already have, but now they, of late they've been delving Mm -hmm. would, would that type of organization be involved in this effort as well? 
Potentially, um, I know in the past, and I'm not gonna speak for the organization because I haven't worked with them in a long time, um, some of the problems and challenges that they saw that different volunteer organizations had was some of the requirements under the Fed and state regulations. Um, but again, if you're willing to play ball under state and federal regulations, um, generally I believe you can come to the table. Um, to that, all that being said and answered, I would, I would support the Scattered program as well and using the connections that we have with other organizations like that, that this is what they do. And like you said, you know, with Habitat being a well oiled machine, uh, to use their assistance to make those kind of things, I'd be supportive of that. Councilmember Coston. Thank you. Just real quick, I think it would be foolish not to take advantage of that program. So I support it. Thank you. So uh, do you need to maybe go down the list here and see if we want to participate in that program? Be great. And that would give you the direction there. Um, Council Member Cosden's pretty much already given her comment. Yes. 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 Thank okay. you. Any other direction you're looking for? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, if everybody's uh, just understanding that when we do get these, um, Notice of funding awards that will be coming back in front of the, the council for official approval of the uh, agreement. So just a heads up that these will be, you'll see these uh, again here, hopefully in the near future. Thank you, sir. Is that all for the hurricane recovery update? Yes, sir. I, oh. I, I have one quick question as it relates back. Um, Mark, when you had gone over uh, your initial uh, piece of this, are, are there any, is there anything that uh, as it relates to some of our uh, just some more minor infrastructure things like street signs, lights, poles, whatever. Is there anything that we're um, still waiting for either approval on, uh, either, you know, hey, you can't touch it until we've seen it and it's said whether we'll cover it or not. Do we have any of that left? No. So so if in our travels we see a sign that's bent over or anything, it's okay at this point to report that and say, hey, might have missed one that was damaged during the year. Uh, yeah, the, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next item of uh, discussion is 4B6, which is boat canopies. Uh, I do have a quick question for council. Looks like we have three more remaining items. Um, I know, you know, we have uh, the canopy discussion. And then we have uh, item seven and item eight. Uh, do we want to try to take a 20 minute break between item six and seven before we start talking about the referendum items? Or do we just want to uh, motor through it and keep continuing? So I figured uh, try to get a consensus from council. I vote a break. If, I, I personally would say we, we take a 20 minute break. Yeah, I agree. After the canopies. Uh, everybody okay with that? Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, next item was the uh, boat canopy uh, discussion. I know staff has a presentation, but this was brought forward by uh, Council Member Steinke, so I will turn it over to him first. Okay. Well, thank you. I uh, had the opportunity to meet um, uh, with staff involved uh, in this, and they did a great uh, amount of uh, research looking at how other areas um, handle this particular issue and some of their uh, components of their ordinances and uh, I think they've put together uh, some alternatives for us to take a look at. I would say this, um, just yesterday in my in my one-on-one uh, -on -one with city staff, uh, after getting some comments back uh, by uh, citizens as it relates to this, that um, they felt that um, the, to look at the actual um, height of the canopy in that uh, during Ian, uh, evidently uh, many boat owners, um, and by the way, I'm one of them, uh, you know, put their boat uh, in their lift, but because of the fact that it could only lift so high because of the height restriction on the canopy, um, that it still didn't get it high enough that the water didn't lift it off of uh, the, uh, the um, um, bunks. And, and for those that did tie it down to the bunk, and so it didn't get lifted off and carried away, uh, went up and actually damaged the the structure, damaged the the aluminum framing uh, for their for their canopy, 
And so um, it was asked of me, and I brought it up to staff yesterday as we would look at this, and if we do consider any changes, um, as we look at some of the ways that the other municipalities handle this around us, uh, uh, some of them don't have the type of height restrictions on it um, like, like we do. And for the most part, when talking about visibility, um, the, the issue was is that when there's a boat in there on the lift, the visibility is not an issue anyway. You can't see through the boat. Uh, and so where the canopy itself is, um, uh, in, in a sense, shouldn't make that much of a difference in, in visibility restriction. So anyway, it was asked that, hey, we you know, take a look at that and whether we add a foot or two to how high the canopy could be uh, to allow the boat to get further away from the water when it's lifted, it was asked to consider that as well. And other than that, I'll turn it over for a presentation of all you found out for us. Excellent. Uh, for the record, Anthony Santor, Cape Coral City Planning Division. Uh, I am here to discuss and continue the discussion of the boat canopies. So we'll begin with just a slight recap from the previous comments from the council from the committee of the whole meeting. Uh, what we heard from council last time was that there was really some life safety concerns regarding structural integrities of permanent systems. That was kind of the main conversation that was had. And really those kind of focused around two predominant things. One was being the uplift concerns for permanent structure, and then two was that projectile and debris concerns from a hurricane event or a storm event uh, could be damaging to people or properties around the area. We also heard concerns about the uniformity of structures throughout the city. Based on the current codes that we have, there is a strict uniformity of canopy systems throughout the city in terms of structure and materiality. Obviously, colors um, can be varied, but the actual system itself is pretty uniform. And that was something that uh, was deemed to be something that could be a concern if we are allowing other systems, you know, what is the visual effect on our canalways and for the residents of those canalways. There was also concerns about the blocking of view sheds to the waterways and what a permanent system may do to inhibit those view sheds for uh, the adjacent residents that are along the properties in which construct alternative boat canopies. There was also a general consensus that if something was permitted in terms of a physical structure, that the metal roofing system would be preferred due to its resilience. Uh, and there was also a general consensus in looking at the proposal for an increase in the area and amount of boat canopies, specifically for properties that have larger water frontage than the standard 80 feet um, for a typical property along our canalways. We'll also touch just briefly a little bit on the existing regulations for the boat canopies. Um, currently, like I said, we only support one type of system. That's our metal support frame of one and a quarter inches with a fabric uh, covering or similar to a fabric covering tarping system, something like that. Our maximum size currently is 720 square feet or roughly 18 by 40 and 18 by 40 is specified as the maximum size currently in the land development code. And we also only do permit one canopy per parcel. We have a 14 foot height requirement from the top of seawall or decking uh, to the top of the marine, from the top of the marine improvement if no seawall is present. Um, and we also do require that a minimum of 75% be open on every side of the canopy and a minimum of 12 foot setback from the water frontage edge unless written approval from adjacent property owners is provided during the permitting process in which that adjacent property owner expresses their approval for an encroachment beyond that 12 foot setback. Uh, and then all boat canopies must be attached to marine improvements um, or seawall if over a public waterway. So as discussed, you know, the questions that uh, council had and some of the direction that we were given, we wanted to understand how other municipalities around us had dealt with this problem or even if they had determined that such issues were uh, important to be dealt with in their codes. So we looked at our adjacent neighbors, um, specifically the city of Fort Myers, Lee County, and Charlotte County. And during our investigation, we went through their codes to determine what they had on the books, um, what it affected, and specifically with an eye toward the life safety, the structural systems, any view shed uh, requirements or concerns, and then materiality. So we'll start with the city of Fort Myers. Uh, so they do have encapsulated a very small section in Article 3, Section 118.3.4.F. Uh, so they do permit roof coverings on docks, piers, wharfs in residential districts, provided one, that all sides are open, 
and B, that the structure is located on the center third of the property's frontage, and that no more than one dock structure is permitted per parcel. Outside of that, there is no other pertinent language that is contained within their code, so there is no area requirement uh, maximums or minimums, no height requirement maximums, no materiality uh, issues or uh, code work that is written in there at all. Then we looked at Lee County and we specifically looked at section 26-74. Um, what we found in there, they had two types of canopies, uh, which they called boathouses, and I believe the other one was uh, shelter, boat shelter. And what we found was that uh, for their side yard setbacks, they require a minimum, excuse me, of 25 feet along all natural water bodies and then a minimum setback of 10 feet along artificial water bodies. They also had a ma maximum area for a single boathouse of 500 square feet. However, they did permit multiple boathouses on areas um, with elongated frontage where a maximum of 1,000 square feet was permitted if they were doing more than one boathouse. Uh, and they did specify that you could have up to two. Their maximum height is 20 feet, and that is from the mean high water line, uh, not from the actual structure. When you uh, compute that out, typically it gets to roughly about the same height restriction we have, which we'll see a little bit later on. Uh, and then they also have that it must be completely open with no enclosures. Um, However, they did specify that you could use wood lattice, chain link fencing, or other open mesh facing materials permitted where the side setback is 25 feet or more. So the more you are setting it back away from the sides of your neighbor, you could put a semi-permeable and semi-transparent membrane on the sides. They also allowed uh, specific uses, um, such as storage uses or seating uses that were ancillary to the use of the boat structure or dock system. So if you wanted to have a storage unit that supported your boat, you could put that under there. Or if you wanted to have a seating system, um, I wouldn't think you'd put a fire pit on a dock, but if you wanted some type of seating around some central area, you could do that underneath the canopy itself. And then they did specify within their code that the structural design is de dependent on the Florida building codes. And the final one we looked at was Charlotte County. They claim theirs as boat shelters, and this was in section 3-9-65, so that their shelters are subject to setbacks determined by their zoning district. Typically for their RSF districts, which are their single family districts, which most of our waterways are, uh, they have a 15 foot setback, which is pretty typical um, in their zoning code. Uh, the depth of the installation into the waterway, that is determined by an offset from the center line of the water body. So basically, depending on the width of the water body itself, the maximum protrusion for the canopy or dock has to be determined by an offset from that. They do not list any maximum areas, and they also do not list any maximum heights, nor any materiality requirements. They do have uh, accessory use requirements. However, they have split out docks uh, and dock structures from the listed accessory uses in their zoning code. Uh, they fall under section B of their accessory uses. And so the requirements that they have for height uh, and area limitations, I do not believe would apply to these types of structures. It's, again, those are separated out from the code locations in which they have. So just to kind of wrap up, what have we seen from our neighboring municipalities? Um, pretty much all of them are less restrictive on their requirements. Um, and they, most of them contain very limited code uh, language in regards to the systems themselves. Uh, where the regulations do exist, they are pretty consistent with our current regulations for boat canopies and, uh, that we have on the codes. Uh, all the municipalities, um, specifically the ones that we looked at, uh, one and that being Lee County specifically mentions the Florida Building Code being the governing structural code for the systems. The other ones uh, imply it and infer it based off of the language that is in their code for accessory structures and development. That's similar to ours in which the Florida Building Code regulates the structural design of the systems. And then materiality is not specified in any of the municipalities. So they do not specify what the structure is, what the roof system has to be, the materiality of the roof, colors, anything like that. They're pretty open with most of what they have. So if we go back to our, the three concerns that we had, um, again, it could be boiled down to these three. It was life safety, the view sheds and visual blight, 
and aesthetics and uniformity. <clears throat> so of the three concerns, the life safety, that is one that is the easiest and to alleviate issues with, uh, and that being that there is a already a codified system in place which governs the structural design and construction of that, that being the Florida Building Code, which currently all of our canopies have to be built to. <clears throat> per the previous discussion, council can choose to increase the necessary requirements for the design and construction of those accessory structures, such as increasing wind load designs uh, and things like that. And the other concerns are a little more subjective in their case. How do you determine what is the most appropriate viewshed angle? Uh, is it from the corner of the setback house? Is it from the, if there is a pool from a defined pool area, is it from the center of the property? How can you define the actual view angle? Um, what is the appropriate uh, opacity of any type of covering that is on there. If there's a physical uh, barrier, what is the height that people, if you have a two-story building, does that mean that your view is going to be impacted if you raise the height? So th those are a little bit more subjective and require a little bit more uh, thought and uh, penciling out of the solutions to them. So based off of that, there were three possible kind of possibilities and directions that we could look at. And they all have their pros and cons. Um, the first one is to keep our existing regulations regarding the boat canopies that we currently have within the LD, L, LDC. Excuse me. Uh, that obviously gives us the great amount of uniformity, um, which we currently have. However, it does offer a limited amount of flexibility. Um, if there are no regulations around us that have these types of requirements for structural systems, other people moving into the area may feel that it may be better or within their best interest to move to those areas where they have greater flexibility to construct what they wish on their, pro on their areas within the right of way that they are allowed to do something. Um, again, that still doesn't alleviate the issues that council had, but that was uh, one possibility. The second is to modify the regulations and to allow for alternative structures and to provide for minimum standards much like our neighbors around us have. I, the pro is that it's a very flexible option. The downside is, is that we lose the uniformity and aesthetics that we have currently, and we also lose the ability to control a lot of the uh, things that we already do, such as the visual corridors, materiality. Um, it would be in line with some of the municipalities, however, I do not believe it's necessarily the best option, but it is a possible option. And then the third is to modify the regulations to allow for alternative structures and then highly regulate those structures in terms of the design, construction, placement, and aesthetics. So if we are looking at option three, and we'll just kind of flush this one out because we think it is probably one of the better uh, directions, um, that the option allows for flexibility to property owners, so they will have the ability to utilize differing systems if they so choose, but it does allow us, especially with the regulations, to maintain a level of uniformity in design and construction throughout the city, so that when you are on a canal way or you are living adjacent to a canal way, uh, your view is um, not blighted by a cacophony of uh, dis disjointed uh, views. Uh, and then the current regulations, uh, maintaining those for what we have, so if people still want to construct the uh, tubular metal or metal canopies with fabric or fabric-like materials, uh, that can be maintained at their current regulations and that the new regulations would be added as a subsection of the allowance for the new structural system. So what would those possible regulations look like? The first would be to allow for what we are considering timber frame canopy systems. Those would be wood framed canopy systems. Uh, and then specifically regulating uh, the safety placement and appearance of that. So the first possible regulation would be that we specifically specify within our code that the structural design must be according to the Florida Building Code. However, we bump the minimum design load, wind load rating up to 170 miles per hour. This will increase uh, Due to what we have heard from FEMA and from other uh, sources, the storm intensities that we will be getting will probably be going up in the future, and this will allow for an alleviation of some of those safety concerns by requiring them to design to a much higher standard uh, as the storm intensities increase, uh, so that even if five, 10 years down the road we are seeing larger storms, the systems themselves are still built to withstand that. So we're not seeing an 
uh, outdated system or outdated structure that has to constantly be repaired, they can be in place for a little bit longer without necessarily um, needing to be repaired after a um, storm event. Uh, the second would be that side setbacks are a minimum of 20 feet from the water's edge to accommodate uh, an opening of the view sheds from a permanent structure system. That the roof structure must be of a gable or hip design and conform to a specific pitch. We have listed a 312 pitch in here, but any type of uh, uniform pitch could be done. Um, it would come down to, if we wanted to get that in depth with the specificity within our codes of how we want the system to look. Uh, the next would be that roof fish finish, excuse me, must be of a non-reflective metal system, and we could go as far as specifying the metal like we did in here as a standing seam. However, we could also leave it up to the homeowners if they wanted to possibly do a corrugated or some type of other metal system uh, on there. Again, it comes down to how in-depth we want to get on the specificity in the code for the uniformity or the aesthetics. Um, we could also leave it more open-ended so that as new systems come online, we don't have to modify the code itself. The system could be incorporated under the metal roof finish uh, language that we have in there. Uh, the next would be that no enclosures of any kind are permitted around the sides of the canopy. So currently we have the 75% uh, transparency requirement. We would bump that up to 100%. The intent of the canopy is to provide shelter for the, system, for the boat that is underneath. And so um, with the permanent nature of the roof structure, maintaining as much open visibility underneath and through there is going to be paramount while the boat while it is on a lift or parked, uh, even if it is in the water, most of the boats we're seeing um, tend to still have a profile that allows for visibility around them. Uh, and so the more we can maintain openness through the canopy or around the canopy, uh, it's only gonna be beneficial to the adjacent neighbors to maintain those view sheds. Uh, the next would be that no structures or ancillary uses of any kind shall be permitted under the canopy. Again, this is just to make sure that the canopy is serving its function of protecting the boat and that we are not seeing large overhangs and things like that that are being constructed where you'll get uh, boat storage boxes and deck boxes and things like that constructed or storage locations under there. The idea is that it is not a boathouse, but it is a canopy to protect your boat. And so limiting those uses and ancillary functions around and underneath it are paramount to maintaining the view shed and the visual aesthetics of the system. Uh, the next, that all the lumber for it shall be marine grain treated uh, and finished with a UV water resistant material. This just goes to the longevity of the material and again, trying to negate some of the um, issues that may accompany such a permanent structure. And then finally, that the final two, one that safety rails are permitted and if they are permitted where they're constructed, they are of two things, one being a tubular metal or the other one being a wood timber, and that the minimum transparency of them are 75%. Again, this just goes to trying to maintain as much openness through and around them as possible. And that the maximum height would maintain at the 14 feet that we have from the deck surface. We obviously can look at exploring higher options for when people do have them on the lifts. I'm assuming if you have a 40 foot boat uh, center council, which is pretty typical and it's, you know, da -da 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 you could go higher, especially when you are on the lift if you needed to, if you were during a hurricane event and you wanted to try and raise that above. So we could obviously look at that and determine if there's a more applicable height. Uh, it also can go down to how the system itself is designed. Is it de designed with straight timber framing across uh, or is it a truss system that uh, allows for the boat to be raised up into the roof cavity or um, if it is just a straight truss system with a roof, does it not permit it to come up? So there could be different options that we could explore, um, or maybe it's just the height itself bumps up if we're maintaining as much openness and the predominant construction <coughs> around it is single family, uh, one level homes. Do we really have any issue with a higher structure in which most people will not be viewing it from an elevated distance, they'll be viewing it from their backyards or from their docks. So the higher height may not have any, any actual impact with it. So based off of that, we have another possible regulation, and this one would be universal for both the current canopies and for the um, timber frame canopies. And one that would be for the maximum allowable boat canopy area to be increased based upon the water frontage of the property. So currently, as we specified, the maximum allowable area is 720 square feet with the size that was depicted uh, earlier on. 
We propose a new formula that could account for larger than standard lots um, with a maximum uh, specificity for a maximum allowable area. So that calculation, excuse me, I was drawing a blank on the word there, uh, would basically be the area of the boat canopy equals your water frontage lot times nine. So for every one foot of water frontage you have, you're getting nine square feet of canopy area. Um, this would be capped at 1,000 square feet, which is similar to what Lee County does. And then we would remove specificities on the size and dimension instead using only those maximum area calculations and limitations. So that if somebody, let's say, wanted to do a, they had a larger boat that they wanted to park and they wanted a specific overhang on the boat itself, let's say two feet because they're worried about prevailing winds or they have it such a way on such a, canal that they had um, accounted for sun shading of the boat for, to avoid bleaching of the gel coat surface, uh, that could be taken into account um, without necessarily, let's say they had a smaller tug or something which had a wider beam than it is long, um, that could be accounted for. So this would also allow for substandard lots that are between the typical three lot and two lots. So if your property is a non-standard, let's say a two and a half lot, you would be capped before the 1,000-foot maximum uh, based off of the allowable uh, area calculation. And then the third possible regulation would be permit additional, and this goes again for both the current uh, metal frame and timber frame canopies, to allow for more than one boat canopy on properties that have more than 80 front feet of water frontage. Uh, currently, like we specified, only one canopy is permitted per parcel. We would allow up to two separately constructed boat canopies, uh, provided one, that the canopy has more than 80 foot of water frontage. Two, the combined area does not exceed the allowable area uh, of the area calculation from the previous section. And that three, the increase of the side setbacks for the canopies is increased from 20 feet to 25 feet. This again is just going to make sure that where you're trying to do multiple canopies, we are not encroaching on view corridors from our neighbors, but maintaining as much possible visual access to the waterway uh, as we can. So with that, uh, we're interested to hear comments from uh, council and to get direction on how you would like us to proceed. Thank you, uh, council member Carr. Thank you, just a couple of questions. Um, why the difference, significant difference in setbacks? The setback difference that we have uh, was looking at the permanent nature of the structure in which we're trying to implement. Uh, obviously a permanent roof system with which, what may require more intermediate supports, uh, piers to support it would increase the amount of uh, visual opacity from the watershed or from the, prop, from the adjacent property to the watershed. And so by setting that back a little bit further, we're trying to maintain a little bit more open distance. And obviously, um, we could massage that distance and we would still probably like to maintain the allowance for an encroachment beyond that if the adjacent property owner were to sign off on uh, the encroachment. So if they didn't have an issue with a 20 foot setback, if you were doing uh, more than one canopy or a 16 foot setback, if they were, your property owner was to sign off on that, currently like we have set up in our current code, the city would consider that acceptable for you to build closer up to the maximum uh, the minimum setback distance that we have specified for marine improvements. Okay, it's still, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about it, um, you know, 12 to 20, 20, 12 to 25 is a significant change um, from the side property setback. And there are two types we, we allow now with um, some of the canopies that are allowable now have a side that comes down, not, it's not just a curvature top, it actually have a side piece that comes down. I can't Correct. imagine a, a wood frame structure being any more intrusive than that as far as visibility goes. If that's the sole reason for the setback change is, is visibility, uh, I just, I think I'd like to take more of a look at that because I think that's, that's a significant impact going from 12 to 20. I think a lot of folks rather have it farther than 12 if they can accommodate the mm -hmm. boat that they want to put on the dock system. But, um, it, you know, and certainly when you get into the larger lots or even corner lots, you can have a a dock on each side, I mean, it becomes very, you know, it doesn't become very impactful on the neighboring properties. So 
I don't know, I'm just curious about whether we need to change the setback requirements to that extent and still accommodate our visibility desires if that's the way we go, but that'd be the only um, major question I had. The other second question was, what is our current building standard miles per hour on the metal portion of the structure, not the canopy, I know that's removable, but the structure itself, what is, what? to what extent is that built to today versus the 170 and the new requirement? I believe accessory structures are required to 150 or 155, which would, this would fall under. I believe our normal residential building is 165. I think it's 140. Okay, so again, why, would, why, the, why the increase to 170? What's the thought process there? Sure, so the thought process was twofold. One, um, as we kind of discussed, was that the uh, hurricane events or storm events as we continue through um, into the future, they are predicted to get a, each stronger each current year. And so we wanted to bake in some, uh, I don't want to call it wiggle room, but some assurities that as those storm events do get stronger, that the systems themselves are built for it. Um, and that the concern from council at the previous meeting was that the life safety issues that potential permanent structures like these can represent, such as the uplift or um, debris, uh, with the roof peels and things like that into the canal ways and adjacent yards is a substantial factor that the systems when designed could meet and exceed the allowable codes to alleviate those concerns. Now again, this is just something that we put through to handle those two positive theories, but uh, if we wanted to look at something that was a little less restrictive, you know, we could do that. The current code still requires it to be built to a certain standard. We can maintain that standard, or we can go above that if we'd like. Okay, thank you. Those are the two things that stuck out to me. I wanted clarification on. Thanks. I think uh, for me, um, I mean, there's a couple things that is uh, important to me. First and foremost, the aesthetics in the community. Uh, I know that uh, you know I've gotten a few uh, phone calls on this topic and and the phone calls that I did receive uh, were those residents would prefer to keep uh, what we have now, the regulation in place. Uh, that way we have pretty much the same uh, type of structure throughout uh, the city. Now, uh, one individual had mentioned there's a couple different, you know, you can have an A-frame, you can have a, a radius top. Um, I kind of agree a little bit with the height that council member Steinke had mentioned, but for me, I think it should be based on uh, high mean water level. And I'll give, and I'll give you the reason for that. Uh, I have a new seawall. My seawall is two foot higher than my neighbors. So I build my dock two feet higher and I'm still and had that same regulation of 14 feet. My neighbor next door has that same seawall or a, a lower seawall with a dock he's already two foot lower than I am. So he's already restricted by two feet just because my seawall height has changed because of the new uh, ordinance that we have on seawalls. So I think it should be based on the high mean water line, um, more so than just the height above the dock because before we made the change with the seawall heights and tried to make them consistent, you had some people doing it a foot higher, some people keeping it the same, some was 18 inches, some was two feet. So you have a variety of levels there. So I think it should be based upon the high mean water line of, of your particular site. Uh, but I would uh, support, uh, because I do know that some residents uh, with the storm surge had the same issue that council member Steinke did, where their boat actually hit the top uh, of the structure. Uh, but for me, I don't think what we have is broken. Uh, one of the other concerns that I have with uh, other types of material out there, uh, my canopy, I can take the cover off in about 30 minutes, uh, and then you just have the metal uh, structure uh, that's left that's fairly open. Uh, the wind can go through, less uh, uh, resistance um, versus a wood structure, a wood structure uh, you'll probably, most of them are built with the eight or 10 inch pylons versus uh, the two and a half aluminum uh, pole that is utilized typically. Um, so there will be some additional 
restrictions on view, just with that in itself, not to include the wood structure that you're putting up. But my biggest concern is, you know, if a person has a shingle roof, they want to they want to put this uh, structure on with shingles. Then those shingles are becoming projectiles uh, during the storm. If they have a tile roof, they want to put a tile roof on it. Uh, the same type of concern. So it's not going to affect that person. You know, if, if my neighbor has that, it could affect me because then that projectile could hit my boat or go further and hit another house. So to me, it's more the safety concern, the aesthetics. Uh, now I think everything looks fairly uniform. Um, it's working. You can remove the canopy uh, top. Uh, the structure is less resilient uh, to the wind then. Uh, so for me, uh, you know, I guess I'm, it's not broke, why fix it? Um, so I think for me, what we have is working. Uh, as you've seen in the data that staff provided, you know, we have up to 720 square feet of a canopy and actually we can apply for a de up to a 10% deviation on top of that. And our department director and development services can approve that so it actually can be higher. Even on a 40 foot uh, standard size canopy, you're allowed that 25% of an obstruction that's a three, put, a three and a half foot by 40 feet uh, that you could actually still come down. Uh, and I think it doesn't even say where that needs to be. You know, you see some people uh, throughout the city, they'll bring that 25% that down about where their boat's at on the, on the uh, so it'll be open above, it'll be open below. Their 25%'s in the middle where the boat is to try to keep the, uh, try to keep the, uh, the sunlight off of, off of their vessel. Uh, for all those reasons, um, you know, I appreciate the work, Council Member Steinke, uh, but for me, I, I think what we got has been working uh, and it's the less intrusive, less likely to have any projectiles in a storm. And for those reasons, I would uh, keep what we have. Thank you. Council Member Steinke. Thank you. Um, I was going to make a comment as it related to the mean high water line as well. In Lee County, uh, on slide number six, uh, by having it 20 feet from the mean high water line, I, I don't know this absolutely for sure, but I, I believe most of the uh, you know, original and older seawalls that we have end up coming in around three to four feet uh, above mean water, uh, high water line. And, and that would then mean that our canopies with the 20 foot from mean high water line would be sitting somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 16 to 17 feet above, uh, above the seawall height. So that would be an increase for sure uh, over the way we are right now with 14 feet. Um, I, I too felt that, the, that, that, that that setback would be uh, a little bit too much of a dramatic increase over what we have uh, right now. So I, I would also agree with council member Car with the we maybe ought to you know not have uh, that much of a of a difference of setback, assuming that we would uh, look to make changes. And the only reason I, that uh, I brought this forward based on some feedback from uh, some of the citizens that came to me uh, was uh, for for two things. One was uh, it, the current system may not be broke, so let's not fix it. But could it be better? Could it be safer? We've all talked about ways uh, you know to to harden our area. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, with the number of boats that we have here and the number of boat canopies that we have here, um, this, you know, this certainly would be a, a hardening mechanism. And, and lastly, the, uh, the, the thought that it only takes 30 minutes to pull a fabric piece off of a frame, that assumes that you're here to pull it off. And we have a tremendous number of residents that are not here when it's hurricane season, and they're not here to pull it off. And we don't necessarily have the amount of handymen, women, whomever, to go and pull those off at the time. So that they end up being a, uh, you know, a, a parachute grabbing the wind and twisting up the, the metal frames and, and whatnot. So, so th you know, this is really more, this isn't necessarily for uh, the, the, the property owner that would be here that could pull off the fabric, no problem. It's for the great number of our people that are not here and it would have the security of their of their boat and of their you know their protective structure for their boat uh, on a kind of a not to worry basis, 
because uh, it doesn't take an Ian. I mean, if, if we've got 90 mile an hour winds, well, those canopies are supposed to come off. And so we don't have to have an event like Ian again that causes these problems for our people that aren't here when those winds come through. Uh, and so it's really, more, it's really more for them than it is for the residents that would be here to pull the canopies off. Uh, and I would again thank you for the work that you did. I think that, all, I think that the, uh, that the uh, recommendations uh, are good ones. Uh, certainly to make some choices, uh, you know, if, if, if we go with, if, if, if metal's the deal, metal's the deal, and we don't have to worry about the shingle issue that the mayor brought up, um, that, that, that it would be uh, a, a metal material if it wasn't reflective. People have choices of colors of their fabrics right now. Well, they can have choices of their colors of the metal too, as long as it's not reflective uh, metal, and if we want to make it standing seam, then all of a sudden that now becomes uniform that that you have the same type of metal being used, at least texture-wise, uh, and, and they can choose the colors just like they can choose their, their colors today. So, um, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, when you look at your square footage of, of covered area, that allows for a pretty darn big boat, you know, for, for the most part. Uh, the boats can only go so far out into the canal anyway. Uh, and so when you consider uh, the dimensions uh, of a boat underneath, you know, a, a thousand square feet or whatever we, we'd end up, that's a, that's a pretty darn big boat. The only thing we didn't really do is we didn't really talk about the fact um, in, in the recommendations of having two canopies that would not exceed the, the amount. It, it was there thought that, that there would be a piece of that in there? I don't remember that we talked uh, about having two. I it's under possible, I guess, under 3B. Correct. And it, and it, and it, but you still couldn't break the 1,000 in total. Correct. So you could break it up between two canopies, but you could not exceed the maximum allowable for your property. So let's say uh, you were doing it on a property that was three lots and your allowable maximum area was 1,000 square feet. Then you could split it up between 1,000 square feet, so two 500s or a 750 and a 250. However, let's say you were a little under a uh, typical three standard lot and your allow maximum allowable was only 800 square feet or 900 square feet. Then you could not exceed the maximum 900 square feet or whatever, uh, based on the way that this was written. Obviously, you know, there's room in, uh, for discussion and massaging of any of the numbers, but that's the way we had uh, kind of looked to model uh, the possible regulation for sure and I, so i would i would i would agree uh with that but i would i would i would have us not have that setback come all the way in to 25 feet i would recommend something understood uh a little less than that yep. so that that's my feedback thank you since it's 12:40, pops cafe closes at one my recommendation is we take the break now i hate to do that in the middle of the discussion but uh, if not then uh uh, we'll have to go somewhere outside the facility to get something to eat. So how about if we uh, come back at 110? Does that sound good? All right, thanks.
Yeah, it wasn't great. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. Uh, I believe, uh, Council Member Welsh, you were the next one in line. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to kind of keep this quick. Uh, looking at the possible regulations, um, I'm in favor of um, all three of them. I think we talked about this before. I like, I like the fact on uh, one that you put those stipulations in there that if it were to be something other than a canopy that it has to conform to the higher wind rating with a metal roof. Um, I think that gives people the option so they're not stuck with only uh, a canopy that could itself um, become a wind sail if not removed. Um, I do agree with the um, area being based on square footage with the formula that you provided I think is a great addition and I also believe that constructing more than one um, should be allowed. Uh, if I've got two small boats, why not put up two small canopies and compared to one big boat and trying to shove two boats under one big canopy. So um, I agree with all your possible regulation changes. Um, <clears throat> I do want to look a little bit or think a little more about the two, uh, the items that uh, Councilman McCarr and Steinke talked about as far as uh, the, the width being back from the water or things like that, that, that they had concern. I didn't have that much time to look into that or, or see their concern on that but I could agree with both of them there that if they feel like that's an issue that uh, something I could support as well thank you okay I uh, don't see any other lights on but I know there's a few council members that haven't commented so any of those comments uh, council member Shepherd uh, I'm not for changing much other than um, the square footage. If somebody has a bigger lot, uh, their privileges should be a little greater, or if they have like a four lot site, um, they should be able to double it if they're going from a two to a four. Uh, just, that's the only thing. Thank you. Council Member Long? Yeah, for me, um, I'm the same. I'm not really um, inclined to try to change something that I don't perceive as a large problem. I do appreciate the amount of effort that you put in to give us all the possible opportunities. Um, to evaluate it, but but yeah, for me, I think it's not a problem that, that needs fixing, and so for that reason, I don't want to mess with it. Thank you. Council Member Cosden. Yeah, I'm going to move away from, from there. I'm in favor of um, updating the regulations to include highly regulated criteria like you talked about. Thank you. Council Member Hayden. Yeah, I'm not for any changes, and um, I brought it up the last time my concerns and wasn't really addressed here about storm surge. And then what might that mean for these structures, not necessarily for the pilings, but we saw what happened to piers, especially along the river, um, and how they pretty much disintegrated um, during storms. So 
I think what we have now in terms of uniformity and aesthetics works works just fine. So no changes for me. The way I see it, I got four to four. Is that what staff has? Then we can go down the line, yes for a change or no for a change if you want to reiterate start with Council Member Cosden. And then we can talk about the change later if that may be the case. Yes. Yes. No. 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 Yes. No. Yes. Four, four. Okay. four, four, right? Four, four, that. Right, exactly. Mayor, can I make a suggestion, though, to that yes and no scenario? I, I maybe. Uh, if, <laughs> <laughs> just what I, what I was going to say was is that, you know, get away from the, 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 um, the, the solid structure modification, but maybe temper it and talk about the height, which I think was a relevant discussion based on a couple of the things that I think we all received and also the uh, number and size. I think those restrictions with the same um, structural criteria that we have, I think those minor modifications could enhance our uh, options for property owners that have a larger lot um, with multiple boats. I think, it's, I think it's important that we can allow folks that have the space and unique property on the waterways to have more than what's allowable today. And I think the height is important because I did see boats float that may not have if they could have lifted a little, couple more feet out of, the, out of the water. So how that measurement is taken, I'm open to that, whatever makes sense. But I think allowing a higher um, ability to go up and also the number if you have the correct property size and don't deviate from our current standards for the type, if that seems to be the obstruction with the council. But I think at least to this, we've gone this far with it I think those suggestions made sense to me as well. So, thank you. Uh, Council Member Long. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a valid point, but I think uh, for me, is that something that if they do have a unique lot or a larger lot, um, that the property owner would have the ability to seek uh, like a variance or a deviation or something from us uh, to go I, about that? Or is I do not believe they could uh, do it for the amount of uh, our specific deviations are for like area. Um, they may be able to do it for height, but I'd have to double check the regulations sure. to be able to specific. That'd be a little bit easier possibly because they are few and far between, I think, in those sites. And so it would give us an, uh, an opportunity or staff an opportunity if it was administrative to do it on a site by site basis so that you can potentially get input from surrounding property owners and that sort of thing mm -hmm. regarding maybe a larger structure. Um, but that would be, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I think instead of a blanket change in the ordinance that we would create, or maybe you look into create, creating a way that we could um, allow them the opportunity to bring forth a request for that um, on a case-by-case -case basis for either us or, or you guys internally to evaluate. Thank you. Can you can definitely look into that. Yeah, for me, I mean, I agree. I, I know a couple of us had mentioned the height concern, so I have no problem addressing that. Uh, and just a little bit of food for thought. <clears throat> the current ordinance, you're allowed up to a 40 foot structure. That's on a standard 80 by 125 lot or any size lot thereafter. So that's 50% of what the overall length is. You're allowed to have a 40 foot, but you have 80 foot frontage, you could have a 40 foot, uh, and that's in our current code. So if you maybe apply that formula, 50%. So if you're on a, uh, a triple lot, you know, 120, you're allowed up to 60. And I think the, uh, the discussion could be is, is that the total? So if you have two boats at 30, can you put two structures up? Or for a person that's on a 40 foot, I'm sorry, an 80 foot lot that's <coughs> allowed 40 foot, say they got two 18 foot boats. You know, so is that a total of length that we want to want to allow? So that could be a future discussion that we could have, but I'm definitely uh, open for that uh, type of a discussion, height and maybe how we apply. To me, I think there should be a formula. Uh, that way, if you're on a, on a quad lot, it's one, if it's a triple, so it doesn't really matter. We have some lots that are 90 foot in length. Um, so maybe we have a formula that you can apply. Uh, so I'd be willing to have that discussion at a later time. Council Member Steinke. So uh, rules are rules. I understand that the solid structure fails at a 4-4, um, but I'm willing to stay involved to try to adjust, uh, to continue to work on uh, um, some, uh, uh, you know, a, a modification mm -hmm. that would address the whole height requirement 
uh, being able to have two and having a formula for total coverage. If you'd like me to stay involved with this, um, I'm willing to continue to work with staff just on those pieces and bring it back with just those three considerations with the same type of structure and coverage that we have right now. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Yep. And then we'll schedule it for a future call. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is item number seven, uh, which is a proposed uh, charter change compensation uh, for council members. I believe uh, council member Welsh had asked for a second on this item, and this is his item, so I'll turn the floor over to him. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as, as we all know, there's been plenty of discussion uh, on this topic over the rec recent few months. Uh, and I, I thought it was time, uh, knowing that <clears throat> we're coming up uh, to where we can put this item on the charter uh, for a vote uh, via referendum that we take a look at this. So I've been working with the uh, city attorney's office and looking at uh, other municipalities around the state as well as local neighbors and um, have, have worked up this proposed charter change. Um, all the information that I had has been provided to everyone in the backup. I don't, I don't think I need to go through it all. Um, I'm interested in hearing what your guys' thoughts were uh, and if we need to push this any forward. So I believe the city attorney will be able to answer any of your questions much better than I can. Uh, and I'm excited to hear uh, what your thoughts. Thank you. All right, and before we, or I open up the floor, uh, just give the city attorney an opportunity if you feel the need uh, to uh, elaborate on anything that Council Member Welsh had mentioned. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, you know, as you can see in your backup material, um, there are a number of municipalities, uh, a lot of which we we look to in order to, um, you know, uh, to identify maybe the better course or to get a frame of reference. As you can see, you know, we've got our, our neighbors across the, the river, Fort Myers. Uh, we've also have what we normally, um, make reference to which is port st lucie uh, and we have other cities that are comparable as to as to population uh, and also in regards to size so um, i tried to accomplish this in the best I possible way to try to get as as a broad understanding throughout the state of florida so that you all would have a a, a sufficient frame of reference as to where it is that we ultimately got in terms of the proposed language, and this is nothing more than proposed language. Um, in reviewing all of the, uh, the identified cities that we have in here, uh, predominantly all of them are either by resolution and or ordinance, and that is either accomplished through their budgetary process or through a separate mechanism where there is a, a separate ordinance and or resolution that is identified for that level of compensation. So what is being proposed in this uh, charter is really not a recreation of the wheel, but is uh, more of a, of a mirror of others and best practices through other jurisdictions that are becoming as complex and as wide uh, reaching as others um, have as, as Cape Coral is becoming. Now, what I did do um, in regards to the proposal, and you have to understand that I'm limited to 75 words that is legally required for the ballot language. So I, I'm right now at 74 words, and, and, and I have to be very, very careful on how I draft that ballot language, because if I draft it in such a way where, where there's um, uncertainty or confusion, or it may encapsulate some things that are not uh, identified within the uh, proposed um, uh, amendment to the city's charter, it is subject to challenge and subject to be stricken, uh, legal proceedings. Um, so the way I drafted this is very consistent with what we have and what we're going to. So going to the actual language, what I've done here is I've looked at all the other municipalities and I've made it a little bit more stricter. Uh, and I really uh, controlled it in the sense of um, identifying what the total salary and compensation uh, that must be done by ordinance and that it must be done by ordinance at your organizational uh, meetings. And I further also identified that it shall not 
take effect until essentially two years after, let's say it gets adopted in 2024, uh, it will not become effective until November of 2026. And it really limits the ability of the, of the mayor and city council to alter that and take, um, take benefit from it. Uh, there is essentially, quote unquote, a cooling off period, which is that two year period of time. Yes, some of you will, will be able to benefit from it. Some of you will not. It will really depend on where you are because we have the staggered terms. But it's really meant to not provide an immediate gratification to those who are sitting on the council. Um, and so with that, uh, like I said, I've made it stricter than others. Uh, all the other ones that I've reviewed are by far more <clears throat> liberal in the sense of what it is that the compensation shall be. But uh, make no mistake that this is um, nothing that is inconsistent with the other jurisdictions that I have uh, provided to you that is made available to the public uh, that will require a, a vote of the electorate to enact it. But more importantly, it will require this council in the event that it does pass to have a more in-depth discussion at a committee of the whole meeting to identify the means and mechanisms by way of which that ordinance will identify what that compensation, what that salary will be, which will be all public, uh, including the adoption of the ordinance, which is, of course, must be uh, public. So with that, I, I gave you kind of the broad strokes. I'll be more than happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Uh, but this is, again, the proposal. If there's an alternative, you guys let me know, and, uh, and I will, of course, try to make sure there's consensus. I will let you know that I'm up against a deadline. Um, in order to get it on the ballot. So I'm very, very mindful of that. So uh, today is probably the day where I have to get an understanding on where it is that you, you as a council may want to see this go. Okay, thank you. With that being said, I'll open the floor for any discussion. Council Member Hayden. Yeah, I think um, the way this is worded now without placing parameters in the language uh, uh, makes it difficult. Uh, basically, the way the language is written now and taking it to ordinance per pretty much gives council carte blanche on setting whatever salary that they want for uh, council members or for the mayor. And uh, considering the temperature in this city over the stipend, um, I think without clear direction in the language about a not exceeding amount or based on voter registration or based on population. I think there has to be some standards set forth in the language, as difficult as that is to get everything in in 75 words, that that language includes some parameters and um, caps on what that salary uh, might or might not be, including, a you know, I think we're going to have to discuss you know, if it's in the language or not in the language, where that places the stipend. Um, so as it's, and I'll, and I'll say this now because it affects the next, next one too, I'm a firm believer in letting the voters decide on critical issues like this. Um, it's, it's their city. They, they should, have a, uh, should have the ability to be able to respond to something like this. But the way this particular um, referendum is written right now it's uh, too ambiguous um, not clear and uh, you know I, I think if indeed it's this council's will to take this forward to ballot it has to be as clear as possible because um, when you're talking about um, a general election where there's already going to be some issues on the ballot statewide that we have to decide um, if these, uh, if, if this referendum were to get in as clear as possible, um, it, it, it presents some challenges for the electorate. And I, and I think we have to be really careful of that. So, you know, I think I'd rather see uh, Council Member Welsh, if you have some alternatives to language, I'd like to hear from my other council members. But as it stands right now, I can't support something that's as unclear as what this referendum is. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Council Member Stanky. You did have your light on. You, you can go to other people for now. Okay, Council Member Clark. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree. I'm, I'm not a fan of this language either. Um, I understand that it does effectively make it a public process moving forward. However, it does shift the burden of the approval back to council after a typical public hearing process, which I know is done elsewhere. Um, I think it can be successful. However, given the current scenario that we're in, I don't think it's the right way to go. Um, I believe the language does incorporate total compensation, which would include a discussion about any type of stipend, uh, which is a positive. However, it, again, it does shift it to a decision by council, which I don't think is the right way to go right now, um, even with a two-year delay in uh, application. I think it also could present a problem in two years um, when that effective time occurs where we have to make a decision. I think it then puts the council in a weird situation where if you don't approve something, um, there's no pay. <laughs> and I think it, it could become a, a unique scenario if, if we had a, a, a vote that we don't anticipate today that could actually happen in 2026. Um, I think I, I would agree with uh, Councilwoman Hayden. I think that we should put it to the voter. I think that we should stick with a referendum uh, process with regard to compensation for city council. I do think it should include some language about the stipend also. Um, if we want to have any chance of success of passing, I think it needs to include some sort of restriction, limitation, elimination uh, in, the la in the 75 words. So a two-part approval effectively is what I would suggest, something to either limit or eliminate the stipend and an application of a salary structure or compensation structure that is tied to population that doesn't require constant um, evaluation for increase. I think appropriate increases are, are important as we get larger, the workload increases um, to go along with the CPI increase that's currently in, in the, uh, in the uh, rules. So I don't, I don't agree with this. I don't think it has a chance of passing. I think, um, I think we should keep it with the voter with regard to compensation as a whole, uh, but come up, with a, come up with language that is fair um, a fair salary that we can agree upon um, and put it to the voter, but also include some sort of restriction or elimination of the stipend. Uh, just a quick question for the city attorney. If we go to a, if we go to a referendum vote for a process or a, a compensation package that is voter driven through the referendum, the enactment, could that be sooner than waiting for the next election cycle to occur? In other words, if the voters agree with a modification to compensation, could that be a, could that be applicable uh, at what, I mean, how quickly after the election would that kick in? It does not have to be uh, the two years out. Part of the reason uh, a, lot of, a lot of places will put it um, for the next regular election is to ensure that the individuals that are in the present council, at least in my experience, do not benefit from the action taken. Even though a portion of you ultimately would, but they're predominantly set in a way so that it is not an immediate benefit to those that are sitting, uh, those that are elected officials at that point in time. But to answer your question, yes, you could. And that makes perfect sense to me. And I guess the point I'm making is if we do go the other route and make it a referendum decision by the voter, I think the enactment can be immediate or virtually immediate, you know, at the, at the appropriate date following the general election. But I think it becomes a reasonable application of that because the voters approved it. And therefore, we could, we could have it applied shortly thereafter if we can come to some sort of approval. Um, I mean, everybody knows what the pay is now with regard with compensation associated with pay and stipend. And so I think, you know, knowing that and knowing the, um, the ability for that to occur, I think it, it becomes a better chance of approval by the voter if we, we address that in the same process, if that's possible legally and within the 75 words. Um, but that's, that's the direction I would suggest some sort of discussion associated with that um, path. Thank you. Council members, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, with 411 municipalities in Florida, it would be ridiculous to have 411 uh, formats in front of us. But in the backup material, there's 14 different cities. Uh, for a good sampling of how other municipalities within the state uh, accomplish this and and so as as I uh, read through all of them there's there's I think there's only one that provides for 
you know, kind of a stopgap of uh, exceeding a maximum uh, increase. Uh, and I was actually surprised that there, there weren't more that had specificity to a formula to how, how, to, how to do this. So, um, you know, certainly to, to some degree, uh, you know, the voters can, can say yes or no to whatever we put out there to them. Uh, and if you take a look at the 14 cities that are on here, there is a variety of stipend-based pieces to their compensation package, if you will, uh, that, that was put together uh, in a variety of, of ways. And so um, I think uh, to use a system like this where if approved, if, if uh, in the, in the uh, election, the referendum gets gets approved. Um, that certainly th there's a model uh, that that would be referenced uh, as eight members, whoever what eight those are, would would say, well, here's the rationale for why we're recommending this. This city does this. That study does that. This one is uh, so, there, so. I don't think I don't think we'd ever have eight people uh, on this side of of the dais. Um, throughout the years to come if we make this change that wouldn't be making some rational decision that could be backed up by saying, hey, this, this is why we're making this recommendation. Uh, and, if it, and if it was uh, provided a, a safety factor uh, for the citizens to make sure no matter what the rationale was that any, any one increase couldn't be more than X percent or, or whatever, uh, then you know maybe we build something that we've got to lose a few words and so we can gain a few words to stay within the limit that we have for the referendum uh, but you know so maybe we so maybe we put a, a maximum in there you know we know what we, we know what it is right now we know what total compensation is right now uh, and the first opportunity to change that there would be a limit if there was a fear that that uh, uh, that someone would run rampant with you know the authority to to set the to set the salary uh, or any other financial benefit in, that's included in that total economic package, um, we, you know we could we could have a limit in there that if it made them feel feel better, you know, for that. But I think to have something that can stand the test of time as the city grows and as uh, you know job responsibilities ebb and flow, uh, I think it does need to be you know a, a fluid system like that, and we got to start somewhere. So. I, it would be uh, my opinion that, and like Council Member Carr said, you know, no sense in going through this. If it's, if, if it's not going to pass this way, how can we support something that's not going to pass? Well, we don't know that it won't pass. Um, and so maybe there's just a couple tweaks to it. Uh, so I, I, I'm in favor of moving forward with having some type of a referendum on the ballot, but maybe we have to tweak what it looks like right now. And I realize we have a time constraint and whatnot. Uh, but uh, maybe you know by having some type of uh, cap that you know no matter what how no matter how the rationale or what formula or whatever just know that at any given time it could never be raised by more than X m might be helpful and, and, and I've uh, Pembroke Pines I think is the one that had uh, that as part of their verbiage yeah but uh, anyway that's that's my input yeah, I, uh, I guess I kind of agree. I mean, <clears throat> the way that the, uh, the referendum is written now, um, I don't think that the community will support it. I have no problem with, you know, approving it and moving it forward. But if you think that, uh, you know, the, the community will, will approve the referendum as, written, as it's written, I don't think that'll ever happen. No chance in the world. Um, and the reason that I say that, it's still kind of ambiguous, exactly what it's saying. <clears throat> Why are we having this discussion today? Because some people in the community uh, didn't like the process with the stipend. And we kind of dictated uh, what our salaries are. So if that's our motive, our motivation here, in order to try to stipulate exactly what our salaries are, this refer referendum doesn't do that. If anything, it gets us back to where we are already. 
the eight of us made the decision, put the stipend, and set, set the salaries. We, we can do the same thing with an ordinance. So the eight of us can do the same thing. So to me, this doesn't get us anywhere different than we're, where we are today. Other than the voters are going to vote yes or no. If they vote yes, it still lands back in our lap. So we're no different place then than we are now because it has to be an ordinance. We're going to have to have that discussion. We're going to have to set the salary, and then we'll have to approve it. Sure, there will be public comment and, and public hearings. Uh, you know, we're, we're, if it's an ordinance, we have to have at least uh, one introduction, and then the next meeting we, we could have the discussion. Um, I just don't see this getting us any different than where we are right now. So if we pass this forward, I don't think it's, it's going to pass. Why go through the motion for something you know is going to fail? Um, just to make it feel good. You know, I'm not saying anyone up here is trying to just do something to make the community feel good, but to me, we got to make sure that we have some type of a result at the end and a better process. Um, and I don't see this uh, doing that. So I don't know if we set the maximum, use the salaries we do now. I mean, we can sit here and have uh, an all-day discussion on just this topic alone. And I know the city attorney says we're on a time restraint. So if we're going to have that discussion and we want to change that, I think the eight of us need to have that discussion. Not one particular council member, not taking anything away from uh, council member uh, Welsh, but I don't know how much time you guys have worked on this now. If you got a majority of council here that's not in favor of this, you know, you've kind of wasted a little bit of time here. And if we're on a time restraint uh, and we do want to move this forward, I think we need to schedule this for uh, possibly a special meeting, have that discussion. Let's, let's have that discussion. All of us bring our ideals, and it's, hopefully at the end of that discussion, we'll come up with a plan. Uh, this particular plan that we have in place, I'm not in favor of. Uh, we, can, we can move it forward, but it's just going to fail, in my opinion. So I think one of the reasons that the community, uh, some of the members of the community, not all, but some members, were we, because we dictated our own salary. Well, we can still do that with this referendum the way it's written. Um, so maybe it needs to be a little more... Uh, identified of exactly how we're going to apply that. Secondly, uh, if this was to pass in an ordinance when we come back, I think it's just as important that we set a level of expectations for, for, for council. Now, I can get $80,000 a year and show up on Wednesdays, not do anything else. And if you really want to take it one step further, I only have to attend every third meeting. That's what the charter says. So I can make 80 grand a year and show up every third meeting. So if we're going to put something to the voters, I think it's just as much important not only to set a salary, but have some type of expectation in there. Now, I know you only have 75 words. That's difficult to do. Now, if it comes back in an ordinance, then whomever the council is that has that discussion they can set their own rules on themselves. Hey, you got to be here so many hours a week or whatever the case may be. Because right now, boy, every, every third meeting I could show up and guess what? There's nothing anybody can do about that because their charter dictates that. So I think there's more than just a dollar amount here. And uh, so that's where I'm at. I think, uh, you know, I think we have some work to do uh, if we want to try to get it in this year. Uh, I'd rather take, take the time, put the work in, get it right where it could possibly uh, at least have a chance with the community. As some of you have mentioned, you know, the, the temperature in the community uh, on this topic is pretty high. Um, so I think personally it's highly unlikely anything will pass. But, it, but if it is going to pass or it's even going to have a chance to pass, it's got to be extremely specific of what they're voting for. This here in my opinion, still an open door policy. Nowhere, there's no reason I can see any any person 
uh, voting for that. So that's my position on it. Council Member Long. I guess just to follow right off of the back of what the mayor just finished with was uh, with regards to the open door policy, so to speak. If I understand the materials correctly, it's, it's more common that that is the case as far as equating the open door policy to the, the salary being established by ordinance. Is that all correct? but one? And, and, of, and all but one that we've been provided. And a few actually do it by resolution, which is exactly uh, even a, a, a lower threshold to threshold than an ordinance enactment. Right. So, so I guess the takeaway for me is that what we what we are bound by with regards to changing those is uh, is in the minority with regards to other municipalities and how they establish their ordinances. So it's not when you say carte blanche approval uh, that that is in fact what a significant majority of every other municipality in the state currently operates under with regards to setting their salaries and compensation. That's correct. Uh, considering, and you have to understand that the logic was the complexity of the city, and I try to equate that to others that are similarly situated just so that if we're going to compare apples to apples, let's compare apples to apples. But we're not asking for anything out of the ordinary, but of course, in, in light of, of the climate, it, it seems that way. Um, but, but, but not for the fact that we, we are the exception here. If we did operate it like many other municipalities that we see, we would have had that discussion and set forth stipend uh, salary, how, however, um, in a way similar to all the other municipalities. With that being said, I think Councilmember Carr had suggested maybe a two-part, and I think that's where we're all also intermingling a little bit between, well, I'd like the opportunity to set specific parameters and create a formula that we put to the voters. Uh, the reason, part of the reason I imagine that this was set by these other municipalities by resolution is because it would be incredibly difficult to put those equations and formulas and things like that on a referendum for the voters. In order for me to legally comply with Florida law, it would be, difficult would be an understatement. Right. And so the other part of his, his, his two part uh, was to eliminate the stipend specifically. It is, am I reading it correctly? I mean, the way that it's written, it, would the stipend effectively be eliminated? It would. Because it, it references uh, the expenses, the it, elimination it, of expenses. It references total salary and compensation and by its legal operation, uh, the, the resolution that set forth the stipend would be uh, Eliminated. It will be wiped away clean. That's my understanding. So I don't think all of us understood that uh, a reading of that, which again uh, adds to the point being made that it's difficult to understand. I think all referendums are because of the the, the character constraints. Um, but I want to be want it to be clear that that would be uh, eliminated as part of this, and then it would be basically yeah. a blank slate with regards to council having to act following. Yeah, and, and just as part of the other materials that are there that is available to the general public, please understand that. The language as, as, as currently proposed is very, very strict. Um, if you look at, at what we've provided, um, all the other municipalities do have a stipend. Sure. So um, it exists as of right now, and the reason why it exists is because the, the language of the charter grants them that authority, essentially because it only deals with salary. So this actually goes a little bit further, it overcompensates. Well, I, 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 in, in recognizing the concerns that, that you know, uh, Councilmember Welsh had, it was meant to be more restrictive. I just wanted adjust. to make sure that was clear because I know that he wanted to make that a point of any future um, referendum, but it is, in fact, contemplated for in the, in the current yep. writing. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Councilmember Cosden hasn't spoken, and then I'll come to you, Councilmember Welsh. Thank you. Before I get into my thoughts, I just have a question, Alex. I think you said that today is the day you need to know from us what you're looking for, but I also heard someone up here say we need to take more time. So uh, today is the day that I need some consensus by the council members. I have to then take that, assuming that I do have some level of consensus, and I have to put that into a what I believe to be will be the language that you all eight, or at least five of you will agree upon. I can't do it next Thursday or next Wednesday, which is a regular council meeting, which means that I have to then go uh, two weeks from next Wednesday, which would be an introduction. Assuming you all agree, um, assuming you all agree, or at least five of you agree, then it could then move to an actual uh, reading. And then I have to be mindful of the fact that if there's any misunderstanding, I would have to then come back for another first reading. And then factoring in your hiatus, I would be it'd be difficult for me in order to get that accomplished in a timely manner, considering all the different nuances that I hear presently. Okay. Um, so I, I put in the cushion, but not a lot. Right. 
We're not bound today, is my concern. You are not bound today, but but for 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 the ability for us to really get something together where where there's at least five uh, in agreement. You know, today is a critical point in time in getting this thing before the electorate on November. Okay. Um, so I seconded this um, several weeks back now, and I didn't understand it to be this. I thought it was going to be different. So um, I was imagining something that gave more control to the voters. And it feels like this, it is nuanced, but I think the perception is that it takes away control. Um, I think it would cause confusion and discord. I think um, it wouldn't pass. I think it would be kind of a fruitless endeavor to, to go about this because putting something on the ballot is not a simple thing. Um, and I think it was Mayor Gunter that said it's basically similar to what we can do now as far as setting our own um, compensation. I think if this had come out of nowhere six months ago, eight months ago, it would have been good, but I think right now with the climate, it's just not, I think it's not the time to be talking about it at all. I don't, I just, I have my listening ears on and I will change, I will change my mind if I'm convinced, but right now I just, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I do want to point out one thing I liked about it though, Councilmember Welsh, I like linking the idea of, uh, linking the pay to the population. I think that makes sense because in my case, I've been here for almost nine years. Population has grown by maybe 60,000, I think, probably. Um, and so has my job responsibility. It's tied directly to the population, and so it makes sense to tie it um, that way rather than just the cost of living increase. So if we ever go down that, this road, I'd like to um, consider that. Um, I think that if we do this kind of thing in the future, we need to have a public input session and even a, like a commission, like the Charter Review Commission, not just us making this decision, because it's a really big decision. I think we need more input when we're making decisions to put on the ballot. Thank you. Councilmember Shepard. Yeah, I, b I believe uh, the expectation part, uh, is it possible for that to be separate? I think it's something that, that really needs to be addressed. Um, I know that when I ran, um, the public thinks um, this is a part-time job. It's one day a week. Um, I know. Uh, with an election coming up, there are people that are considering running that also think that. And um, I know, as well as uh, some of you other council members, know that the, the job isn't that. It's a lot more than that. And uh, the public needs to learn what's really involved with the job so that we have people apply uh, that don't get elected and then realize, wow, this isn't what I thought. But on the other hand, as the mayor pointed out, you can get away with being elected and really not doing the job. So I think we need to work on, on that as well. Council Member Welsh. Thank you. <clears throat> I think um, what I was really trying to do with this and crafting with the city attorney was, was make it similar to what other municipalities do. We could all sit up here and argue uh, how much work it is, how much time it is, set a certain percentage, things like that. Uh, we always have to take it to the voters to approve. Um, I think what Council Member Steinke said about potentially making this more palatable to the voters by putting a cap on it uh, could be done in the limited space we have um, with the 40 words or whatever to get it on the on the charter, but. If we don't start this now, in two years, when's the next time we can do it? Two years? It could come up again? 2026. Okay, so 2026. So then, yeah, so then, then we're looking at uh, addressing this again. So I don't see any harm uh, in, in putting this to a referendum. It puts it back in the voters' hands. I do see with uh, changing the ways they are, the way that this is done, uh, also provides for more public input and more uh, settings for it than just adding uh, something to a consent agenda and, and getting voted on uh, with very minimal public input. So I think this uh, fixes what the negative that we've gotten right now, which is that there wasn't much public input into the decision that was made with the stipend uh, and that this will provide that opportunity 
for the public and more transparency. So that's why I was in support of taking it this route. Um, thank you. Council Member Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, only because this is our only opportunity to speak about this. I just want to make a couple, other, a couple more suggestions. Um, with regard to the performance element, I think we can accomplish that within our rules. We don't necessarily have to have a charter change to put you know, responsibilities or more strict responsibilities or expectations upon council. Is that correct, uh, Mr. City Attorney? Yes, you can delineate that within your rules. Um, if, if you want to, if you want to address what the what the mayor made reference to regarding the uh, the attendance in terms of of what will be uh, the minimum requirements, that is actually within the charter. But if you want to actually delineate like benchmarks, uh, that's something that could be accomplished within the rules. Okay. Um, just and to clarify, the fi five fifteen, I believe, is the last date of intro to make this happen this year. Correct? I would have to. Uh, I'd have to work back. I'm going uh, off of what you've given me, so I'll, that's, then, then, I think that's an accurate date um, of yeah. our last. The intro must occur on five fifteen to get it on this year's election. Right, so that'd be the intro would be five fifteen. Then fourteen days later would be the the actual adoption. six twelve yeah. would be the uh, the meeting date prior to. And then you folks go on break. Correct. So I think we do have some time built in here if we choose to take it, um, even at another cow meeting, I think we have that time available um, to vet this a little bit further. I do think, I do think, I have confidence that you have the ability to write something. I'm not a lawyer, however, I think we can simplify it to a degree uh, within the 75 words, hopefully to meet the legal standard, uh, to maybe accomplish some of the discussion that we're having here with regard to the amount itself for compensation uh, and the elimination of the stipend. Um, I mean, effectively, if we don't put anything on the on the referendum, nothing changes until December, potentially, when we have our organizational meeting next year or this year after the general election, I believe is the next opportunity to discuss the stipend itself. Correct. That is correct. OK, so, you know, given that, I mean, there's there's I think we do we have an opportunity here to uh, modify our compensation, which I do believe um, warrants an increase from its base in the charter. I would support that. Um, what that number is, I think, is something we could discuss in another meeting, potentially. Uh, but I think the language with, with that number plugged in would be something maybe we could um, have worked up if we can get consensus. Um, with some other language also within that eliminates the stipend as part of that package, or at least a reduction or something, some language associated with the stipend that we can come to an agreement upon. You couldn't do that. You can't do that within the same. Cannot do that. Not okay. within the ballot language. Okay. That's why if you if you look at the actual ballot language, the way I have it written presently is um, eliminating payment. Eliminating the operative legal word is eliminating payment for expenses and requiring the city council to establish. So uh, I can't put that word in there because there's no reference to. Uh, that word within the existing charter. So that's why I'm very mindful of that. Is there any way to say this is the maximum allowable compensation within You could the certainly do that as long as the five of you identify what that maximum uh, allowable amount, but that is what I, what I need to, uh, what I need to get from you eight is, is where does it that you want to go? Okay. Uh, and, and, and maybe so I'm not getting that. Maybe that's not able to be done today. I think the amount will be difficult because I think we all want to do some more research um, other than maybe the 14 that have been provided here today. Um, because I think it's, you know, and I do believe that going with a charter modification with a vote by the, by the electorate is important. These other jurisdictions that do it through ordinance, that could have been the way that the city's charter initially began. So they didn't go through what we're asking for, which is a modification to the original charter to give council the authority through ordinance to, to adopt their own compensation package. So like you said, apples and apples, I think it, we need to know the history of how they got that authority. Was it, was it, was it from their original charter? Or was a modification made as it moved forward? Um, you know, those things I think are also relevant to that discussion. So uh, I do think it's important to get something on the ballot. Um, I don't think it's what we have here in front of us today. So. I think uh, that's about all I can say about this. Thank you. Council members, thank you. Thank you. Just a point of clarification, um, Mr. City Attorney, and that is um, if done by ordinance, while it 
in effect takes two years to put into effect what that ordinance establish, establishes. Um, does that mean that compensation itself can only be changed a maximum of once every two years? Correct. Uh, well, it won't take effect. So if you were to try to change it in between the election season, uh, it wouldn't be effective until the next election cycle. So let so let let's say let's say this were to pass, um, and it became effective, and it would become effective for those people that are elected in November of 2026. And let's say those folks in November of 2026 wanted to modify that in 2027 they couldn't uh it wouldn't be applicable until 2028 provided there's at least six months because there is that six month kicker so the reason i wanted to establish that is is that when and words matter and you know we we, we don't set we, we don't have the um authority right now to set our salary. The charter sets our salary right now. We had an introduction of, a, of another piece called the stipend, which many other municipalities have, have put in place as, as well. Yeah, and to be clear, that is not salary Correct. under the charter. Correct. So, so um, when, when, when we say that this eliminates the stipend, um, it talks about total compensation. And when we look at how other cities do it, there are different component parts to compensation in all of them. And so that's where I bring back this whole idea of um, a, a, maximum a maximum allowable allows different component parts to be changed, but never the total compensation being allowed to go more than X. And so like Pembroke Primes has 25%. So who cares which piece of the puzzle might get changed? In total, it, when you add it all up, whatever they do by ordinance, it can't add up to more than 25% of what it used to add up to, no matter which part it was. So they could introduce pieces, they could pull pieces out, they could change whatever they want, but when you add it all up, it can't go more than this. And the reason I bring that up is, is the 25%, um, when we look at it, being able to be changed every two years. And with the thought that as the community grows, the job expands, which can affect um, compensation, I think 25% is extremely liberal because even, even the fastest growing areas, you're talking about growing by 12.5% each and every year if there was a correlation between a maximum allowable increase and not. So if there were a cap, no matter what the pieces are, because we know what the pieces are right now in, in, our, in our world, um, and however those pieces go together or get pulled apart, if there were a cap, I think that would supply some uh, form of, of safety net of a council, this one or any other one, going rampant with how they would address their compensation. It would allow for different pieces for different reasons. And what I know is that there's some municipalities that actually have compensation pieces for those members of council that take on other responsibilities, like Florida League of Cities, like, like uh, uh, um, Tourist Development Council. Like, so if, if, if a particular member takes on that responsibility for the city, then there's a way in their compensation package that then uh, remunerates them you know, for that. And so with the thought that the, the things can change where today we know what our responsibilities are today, and I absolutely agree that the charter should be changed as it relates to actually putting in writing what the responsibilities of the members are other than one meeting every three weeks. I think that, there, that as, as things would state, change statewide and countywide, it may add some responsibilities, it may subtract some responsibilities 
based on those changes. And because of those changes, that may be rationale for why we would want to change the compensation now that something's been changed at the county level or at the state level and how that affects the work of the mayor or, or council members. So I think there's got to be some flexibility that doesn't require a referendum every time you want to change something. Um, but then to have a safety net there that says, hey, you can't go crazy with this. So I'm in total agreement that we shouldn't put it out there as it is right now. I think, it'll, I think it will fail as quickly as it's put in their hands. But I do believe we might be able to modify it if we have enough time to do it. And in my opinion, I think leave the flexibility of different pieces of the puzzle, but put a cap on that the total compensation can't be increased by any more than a certain amount in, in a two year period. That's, that's all, thanks. Yeah, Council Member Cosden's next and she's the last light I have on. If we don't have any more lights after her conversation, I think we have three choices here. Keep the existing, didn't sound like too many people were in favor of that, but that's one choice. Second choice is to modify it and have a discussion at a future meeting. And the third uh, choice that I believe I heard Council Member Cosden uh, mention was uh, due to the climate now, not, not to do anything, not to move any referendum forward. So I think that's our three choices. You're existing, have future meetings, try to modify what we have, uh, or not to do nothing. So I'll give you the floor, Council Member Cosden, but if no other lights come on, we'll just go down the list and, and uh, try to see where a majority wants to be. <clears throat> okay, just a question about the wording um, in the referendum. It says eliminating payment for expenses. Can you clarify, does that mean expenses? Like if I go to National League of Cities and I fly there and I stay in a hotel, those expenses aren't covered? So that is the provision within the charter that currently exists and the amendment would require for that to be identified within the ordinance itself at the time that you folks decide as to what it is that that will be. So you would be delineating that expense, uh, that expense amount um, in the ordinance itself. Okay, thank you. Council Member Welsh. Yeah, I just wanna reiterate kind of what I've been saying is we're what I'm really trying to do here is remove this uh, from the charter. Um, I do agree with Council Member Steinke that um, putting a cap on it um, is going to be a lot more palatable to the residents. But with so many pieces and so many more things involved with the amount of meetings, the different um, organizations that we're involved with, I think this is something that uh, well, that, that should be removed and done by ordinance. Um, I really do like the component where it doesn't take effect unless you're uh, coming into office. And I believe this is the first step um, to, to change the way our city runs things like this. Uh, to say that we don't think the residents are gonna vote for this um, is just an opinion of each of us up here. So I really would like to see and have the residents come back and tell us by uh, you know, a, a zero to 100% no vote, uh, then we know that they don't want to change the charter. Mm -hmm. But until that, you know, I, I don't want to kick it down the can for another two years. Thank you. Yeah, I guess for me, I, I uh, and I guess we'll take it to a vote. To me, I think we have some more work to do here, some more discussion. So for me, uh, to have a additional discussion in two weeks at, at a future committee of the whole uh, I think is, is good. I do like the uh, ordinance com component of it. Um, you know, one thing that you, we have to keep in mind that we're changing the charter, so that's going to hamper future uh, councils on exactly what they can and can't do. I, I kind of like the maximum uh, amount or or I like the, uh, and you could put this in an ordinance that you're not allowed to exceed 25% in any given year or whatever the case may be. Um, 
but the way that it's written now, I just think it's just too open. I don't think it'll it'll pass. Uh, so for me, I'd probably uh, agree to have some more in-depth discussion. And I think if we come back in two weeks, it gives each one of us time to think of what, uh, you know, how we would like to see that uh, listed on a referendum. And we'll have that discussion and hopefully uh, be able to come up with at least five of us that are uh, on the same page. We may or may not do that, but I think that's what the goal should be. Uh, seeing no other lights, uh, again, I think we have three choices. Uh, move forward with the existing language. Set up a meeting uh, in two weeks at a committee of the whole to have uh, further discussion. And each one of us will have our homework assignments to bring uh, what we feel uh, is important to list in the referendum or no action at all. I think that's our three choices. Uh, so since we've been starting with Council Member Cosden most of the day, we'll start at the other end with uh, Council Member Carr. Um, yes, I'd like to come back and have further discussion about other options and other language that we could possibly get on the ballot. too hot um, right now for what I had talked about at the beginning was a not to exceed a man or a cap whatever it might be the, the uh, referendum has to be as specific as possible what I did want to ask you is since we're in a presidential year and we have, we'll have so much on the ballot typically local referendums appear at the end of the ballot correct yes this will be at the end and that's something to consider in an election year because Things can get bypassed. Uh, there can be confusion. Um, typically, midterm elections, it's it's uh, those type of local ref referendums can be more receptive to people. Um, and there was some discussion earlier about well, other cities do it this way. I think we're in a more unique position than other cities because of the stipend, because of the salary, and where that total compensation package may place us among other cities in the area so i think we're a little bit more unique which uh, brings a cap more into play i think than it does with other other cities based on what we're making now because of the salary and because of the stipend um, even though i still think the temperature in the city's still too hot regardless of what the language is beyond where we're at now um, i will uh, lean on the side of having another meeting uh, the next committee of the whole, but if, if there's no consensus there, my recommendation would be uh, to allow another council to um, continue with this discussion for uh, possibly a 2026 referendum. Thanks. Council Member Welsh. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do what I did last time and go with a, a B plus. I'm upgrading from a C plus. I'll take the second option. Uh, as far as well, let's talk about this more, but I really um, did like the idea of putting a um, a cap on there, uh, like council members thank you said i I think for public opinion that that gives them um, gives them the, the control that they need but also allows us to work within those parameters. Thank you yeah, I agree. I think the ordinance is something that needs to be be done uh, eventually, whether that's now and uh, because of the climate or not is another thing. I think because we are unique, we need the ability to uh, set the parameters in something uh, more than 75 characters, which in this case would be an ordinance. So anything we could do to get there, uh, I would support. So for me, B, and we'll come back and hopefully hash it out and push something forward um, for the city attorney's sake uh, relatively soon. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think we still have some more discussion and uh, look forward to the uh, meeting in two weeks where we can have uh, Further discussion. More discussion. Modify and revisit. Same. Give you the direction, Mr. City Attorney, and the only assistant. direction I've got is that we're going to talk about it on the twenty fourth. Yep. I look forward to that. And, and again, I, I if I don't have five, uh, and, and and I know that it's a difficult endeavor, but 
um, if there isn't five, then there really is no ability to move forward. That's the uh, drop dead date is what you're telling us? Pretty much. Okay. Um, and that's only based upon me looking at the calendar right now. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to uh, next item on the agenda. Item number eight is a, uh, another discussion with a referendum. Uh, just to give council a little background of why I added this uh, particular item uh, to the agenda. Uh, Mr. Bashaw had uh, submitted a petition to council uh, once he had, had done that a, a couple weeks ago. It started its normal uh, process. Uh, I thought that since we were already having a discussion on referendums and there are some time restraints, uh, I added this as a discussion uh, for today. Uh, my goal here as many of you are aware, petition to council, uh, individual has 10 minutes uh, to make their, uh, their case on their petition. I reached out to Mr. Bashaw, I asked him if he would uh, come today, since we were already having uh, referendum uh, discussions, uh, and he was willing to do so with the understanding that he would get the same 10 minute period that he would if it's a petition to council, and then after today, he would withdraw his petition. Uh, so he will still get his same opportunity today that he would have uh, during, the, during the process with the petition to council. Just so council is aware, petitions to council must be heard on a regular meeting day. Uh, they can't be um, heard on a committee of the whole. So that's why uh, when I checked with the city attorney, he said we could add it for today. So I just wanted to first off make sure that all of council uh, is okay with that and to give Mr. Bashaw the 10 minutes just like he would uh, a petition, and then we'll open up for a discussion from there. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, with that being said, Mr. Bashaw. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, for the record, John Bashaw, Northwest Cape Coral. Uh, I'm here this afternoon to speak on a topic that I think is both uh, important and it's timely. And I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, the topic is how we elect our city council members in the great city of Cape Coral. Uh, before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that there were some uh, supporters of this idea in the, in the audience today, but they have since left. There were some members of the Southwest Cape Coral Action Committee who were here. Um, they're still here in spirit. So there are some people I'm sure watching as well that are supportive of this. My ask uh, is really pretty simple. It's that you allow the qualified electors in Cape Coral to vote on changing from at large to single district voting for city council members. I'm not asking you to make the change. Um, really, you're, you're not empowered to make that change. It would have to go before the voters as a result of a charter revision. You are, however, on the critical path to making the change. So how would you allow the electors to make the decision to change? Well, voting is a government function that's enabled and defined very clearly and succinctly in the city charter. It's in section uh, 401 out of article four. And it simply says, there shall be one council member elected from each district by the qualified electors of the city at large. Therefore, a city charter change and a resolution would be, acquired, be required to make this happen. This is a much more binary decision than the previous topic that you just discussed. I wanna provide just a bit of background though for those that may not be familiar with how the elections are held and um, how districts are determined. There are seven city council districts in the city of Cape Coral, each is represented by one council member. And after every census, those districts are realigned based on population. So geographic boundaries are drawn, but they are based on the population from the census. And um, there are about 20,000 qualified electors in each of the seven districts for a total of 140,000 qualified electors in the city of Cape Coral. Now, I live in District 6, and in 2024, this year, I'm going to be voting in 
districts, or I'm going to be voting in races in district two, three, four, five, and seven. I don't live in any of those, but that's the way that it happens. I'm suggesting that there is a better way of making it happen. So why do I think this is important? I have, why do I think switching from at large to single district is important? I have some personal reasons, but there actually is a lot of discussion on this topic. The National League of Cities in Cities 101 states that residents of a particular geographic base have a better chance of being a, represented on council. And the sub-reason there is that single district mitigates the influence of large out-of-district voting blocks on local elections. Elected, also stated in, in the publication, elected council members are more attuned to the unique problems of their district. District, district elections may improve citizen participation. Larger municipalities tend to use district elections, and we are a larger municipality. We're gonna be a top five city. We're 120 square miles in area. It's probably 14 miles from Redfish Point to the tip of Crystal Lake, and we have over 200,000 people in our great city. Additionally, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in Section 2 states that at-large voting can be discriminatory. Now that discrimination is primarily on racial and eth ethnic basis, but um, the, premise is still, the premise still holds. In the United States versus Town of Lake Park, uh, the complaint alleged that the town's at-large system of electing its commissioners denied black voters an equal opportunity to elect representatives of their choice. Finally, the 1967 Uniform Congressional District Act banned at-large congressional districts. The thing that's most important to me is that at-large voting dilutes the voting power of district members. Think of it this way. There are 140,000 qualified electors in the city of Cape Coral. On average, there are 20,000 in each district. A district race, therefore, worst case, is 20,000 against 120,000. So in the worst case scenario, the residents in the district, 20,000 that are registered, are competing against 120,000 throughout the city. Now there are some risks to switching. Uh, one of the risks, and this is widely publicized, that it may be difficult to find candidates who can wear two hats. I would ask you though, had you been elected in single district, if we had single dif district members, would you act any differently than you act today? There may be some infighting caused by siloed thinking. Again, I would ask you, would that be the case had you been elected in a single district uh, race? Uh, also, in your hard copy, you see that we have some uh, statistics on the number of qualified electors. As I said, it's, you know, it's on average, it's about 20,000 in each of the districts. There's a tremendous amount of variability in there. The standard deviation is 1334. Uh, if you look at District 6, there are 22,082. And in District uh, 3, for instance, there's 18,000. But nonetheless, there is still a it's, a, it's a, there is the advantage that the 120,000 can dilute the vote of the 20,000. So what would it take if you were to say, um, let's move forward with this? Well, there's a couple of things. It could be further analysis by a select committee, a charter review committee, or staff. Um, it would require placement on a primary or a general election ballot and there's a 120 day notice like we've talked about in order to make that happen. Um, we would have to uh, really understand the cost of the enterprise of doing this, but it's minimal. Uh, from my research I found that the cost of the enterprise is primarily administrative to write the, the language, though there may be some translation costs, a couple hundred dollars at most to make it happen. We also would need to do some education in the city 
And it's not re-educating the city, by the way. In my opinion, it's educating. I was amazed to find that there are many people who really don't understand what at-large is or what single district is or how they're voting. And I think uh, just a, a good education campaign, if we were to move forward with this, would be very important. And certainly we have the resources in our great city to do that. So what are the next steps? One would be that you do nothing. That, that's always an option. I hope that's not the option, but that certainly is one. Um, another is it, if, if it is in your will to move forward with this change, to put it to the voters, to let the debate happen at the ballot box, then a resolution would have to be drafted and it would have to appear on, on a ballot for the voters to make the choice. Certainly we could have future discussion at a, a, at a future meeting if you choose to do that. But the, the bottom line is um, I think we should make a decision relatively short, and I would ask you to do this, to make a decision relatively quickly on whether or not you think it's right to move forward. I am not a subject matter expert on this, and the reason I've taken this up is I have a lot of passion about the topic, and I think it's in it's in the sandbox in which a resident can operate and raise to council and ask you to address it. So I wanna thank you for your attention today and um, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that being said, I will open the floor up for uh, any discussion. Council Member Corey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bischoff, for being here and making your presentation. It's been a long morning for you, I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in the discussion. <clears throat> I think it warrants discussion. Um, I'd like to offer another alternative. Um, I, it's a hybrid model, and this is not uncommon either. You kind of benefit from both sides, the at-large discussion and the single-member district. Um, what that, and I'm not an advocate of adding districts by any means. I think the number eight uh, should not be increased. Uh, but going more in the line of realigning our districts and going, say, four single member districts and four at large uh, candidates. Therefore, you, you're gaining some of the benefit that you're describing about not being pushed out by the rest of the city's vote in your particular geographic area of the city. Um, but you're not putting it in a smaller box uh, that exists today with, say, 20,000 um, registered voters and a geographic size that goes along with that. Um, it's just an idea. Um, I don't know what the rest of the council feels, but I, I did a little looking at it. I have worked in jurisdictions with both single-member voting districts and at-large elect elections. Um, from a staff perspective or an employee perspective, I didn't see any major difference with the way the city was operating. Um, I do think you get better advocacy for issues in the particular area that you're elected in for obvious reasons. Um, you have more um, loyalty to that part of the city. I do agree that if, you, if you're doing this correctly, you're going to still have open-mindedness about you know, votes that occur outside of your particular um, area that you're re representing. But I do think the representation goes up um, and the ownership is, is there more with that type of... Uh, election. So I'm not opposed to this idea. I certainly wouldn't be opposed to forwarding something to, for a potential vote, see what the public feels. Um, I think there's some education elements to it that we need to make sure everybody understands what it is and what it isn't. Um, but I, I would also like to have some discussion and maybe some look uh, at a potential hybrid model like I just described with four you know, quad, make four quadrants, whatever the geographic lines are, would be, have to be determined statistically, but you'd have, you know, best of both worlds almost. You get, you know, four, four um, at-large and four single-member voting districts, albeit bigger, but it's still conceptually, I think, what you're looking to do, um, just a little bit different than what you presented. So, thank you. Thank you. Council uh, Member Hayden, you're next, but uh, Mr. City Attorney, uh, just to clarify for all of Council, um, because I've heard this uh, mentioned twice so far, the educational component. My understanding, if a referendum is placed on the ballot, is the city allowed to do an educational 
component. And not spend governmental resources in that in furtherance of that. That's a legal prohibition that went to effect. I believe it was about a year or so ago that prohibited that. That was a change. And I knew that. I just wanted to make sure all council knew that. Council Member Hayden. Yeah, John, thank you for your presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I respect who you are, respect what you've done for the community. You and I have had earlier discussions on this. You know I'm on the way other side mm -hmm. of this thing. This is obviously something I've investigated and researched and written about for the past 20 years. And I can go down a list of evidence as to why single member districts are absolutely the wrong thing for Cape Coral. If you look back at the, and as far as diluting the vote, um, to give that some perspective, um, in 2020, when, uh, which is the first year since <clears throat> 1996 that our uh, uh, elections moved to a presidential year, 81% um, of the electorate voted. Our top vote getter that year got 53,000 votes. The lowest vote total that year, I think, was 38, 39,000. You look at Fort Myers, Granted, a much smaller city, single member districts. Ward four, the winner got 2,500 votes. Ward six, which was the highest, got 7,183. You take our electorate at 140,000, you look at the number of districts, you know, you're looking at uh, possibly, let's say in my district, for instance, district three, of the winner getting possibly 10,000 votes. Now, the difference here is um, we make decisions for the entire city, not just for our particular district. I believe voters should have a right in deciding those eight winners uh, because they are making decisions for everyone. Um, you limit that to per district, uh, single member district voting, to me you're, you're diluting the ability of all of citizenry to participate in a voting process where those elected will be making decisions for the, for the entire city. Um, you know, there's been talk in the past that <clears throat> it doesn't take as much money to run if you're running for a single district. The value of the amount of money you put into a race is, is up to you. Um, I ran a campaign, citywide campaign for $19,000. And the difference is, you know, we had a strategic plan on being able to do that. I believe since we went to a presidential year uh, voting now, I believe we have a more informed electorate uh, because of mail ballots. I believe, and that's the way most people are voting now. I believe that those voters do do their due diligence now and understand what all the candidates have to offer. You go to a single member district, Possibly that voter's only looking at that particular candidate. They're not understanding what the physicians, the platforms, and the other, uh, from the other district candidates uh, might be about. Those are the ones that'll be making, making their decisions um, as well. So, um, you know, in, in a city like Fort Myers, where you might have a bit of a different demographic and type of population um, uh, and, and you look for equal representation or fair representation, um, Fort Myers has a lot more history than we do. You know, I believe our city is fairly represented by all those who are elected. In the past, until recently, we've had African Americans elected, we've had Hispanics elected to our city council. Um, so I think you've had representation throughout the city uh, through the years that, that we've had that. John, the one thing we do agree on, even though I'm totally against single member districts, and I said it at the beginning, was um, if there's an appetite for it, it should go before, it should go before the voters. But I think for this city, as it grows, citywide voting for citywide representation is absolutely crucial as we move forward with making key decisions in our city. Thank you. Council Member Welsh. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with uh, both council members uh, that spoke before me. Um, I don't think we're at the point where um, moving to all single member 
districts would be would be good for the city um, but I would like to entertain the what it would look like if we did some sort of hybrid model I think that's a, a good step to take uh, eventually knowing the size of the city is going to get to um, once we get to that point maybe move to single member but uh, looking at something where it could be a 4-4 four, four, um, hybrid uh, is something that I would definitely consider thank you Council Member Shepard. I think we should uh, let the citizens decide. I think there's uh, pros and cons with both. Um, I know uh, with our city growing and uh, as large as it is, it's very expensive for somebody to enter into uh, running for office, especially if uh, they don't have a name in the community. Uh, it can be very expensive to advertise to 220,000 people instead of just advertising to your district. Um, so I understand that. Um, but like I said, there's, I think there's pros and cons to both. And I'm fine with letting the citizens decide. That's my opinion. Councilmember Steinke. Thank you. I uh, am, am almost a, a mirror image of Councilmember Hayden, uh, but for a, a couple different reasons. One, uh, reason is is that when we when we talk about larger cities um and before i would do that um john thank you for uh, putting this together and having the passion around it that you have and for all that you've done for the city and the northwest um and i've been uh um pleased with the opportunity to work with you uh a year ago going through ian recovery and, and to spend some time with you so um so i appreciate that and and uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think at this point uh, that single member districts isn't right uh, for the city. And, and, and part of the, the rationale is um, just because we're a large city um, doesn't mean that we've necessarily gotten to be a large city the same way other cities have gotten to be large cities. And uh, many, in, at least in my opinion, I think the difference between at large and single um, member districts has a lot to do with the maturity uh, and the uniformity of the city. And so um, Cape Coral is unique in that it is developed um, not, not, from a, not, not from a centriplex, but basically kind of from the outside in, in a lopsided way because we're a Cape. And the attraction was to live along the water and then the infilling occurred and then moving further and further away from Sanibel, if you would. So we, we, each one of the districts doesn't have the same infrastructure that the other ones do. Each one doesn't have the same amenities that the other ones do. And so in my opinion, the at-large uh, design uh, breeds more of a, we're all in this for the entire city than it, than it breeds kind of a jump ball environment that that representative is only concerned about and only responsible to their district's citizens. And, and those district citizens would be expecting that council member to um, basically put their interests above and beyond anyone else's. That's what they would be electing them to do. And so to kind of answer your question, would I have done things differently if we were a single member district and I had been uh, elected in a single member? I believe I would have, because I believe those people that voted for me would be expecting that of me. Uh, and I think that could have been detrimental to, to the needs of other districts. And so uh, kind of to reiterate what a couple other people have said, so it's important for me to know and care about the other members of the other districts, just as it is that I understand those of the, of the members of, of my district. And so uh, having the district uh, council person have to live in their district, I think is important for geographic diversity so that you didn't have just a, 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 you know, a large number of council members that live in one locale, because that would you kind of create it then at that point, you could overload the, the uh, um, concern for that area. So to have the geographic um, diversity of having the, the council members have to live in the district in, in, in which they would be uh, elected, 
for them to know all of these citizens and for the citizens to know all of the council members and know that this, we're all in it together, especially at our maturity level, until we get to the point where we have an equal distribution of infrastructure, an equal distribution of amenities, I think, I think this has to be a leadership team rather than seven individuals that are looking out for seven different locations and fighting for the dollars, fighting for the resources, fighting for the assets, um, trying, to, trying to win for, for their folks, so to speak. And so that's, so that's where I am, and I, I, I don't think the city is ready for uh, single district governance at this point uh, for all of those reasons. So I would, I would not be in favor of looking at single member districts at this point. Thank you. I guess I'll uh, weigh in on the topic as well. Um, first, John, thank you for coming out today, and I appreciate uh, not only today, but everything you do for the community. You're always there, and I, I want to thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I know you and I have had many conversations uh, over the six years that I've been here, and most of the time, uh, you and I are on the same page. Uh, but unfortunately, today, I, I guess I have a difference of opinion. And I kind of agree with Councilmember Hayden and, and Steinke, um, where when you look at some of these cities that have single member <laughs> districts, most of those cities are already built out. And I think that is something that we have to take into consideration in making this decision. Because as we all know, um, we are voting on issues, even though geographically, as Council Member Steinke stated, that we have to live in a particular area. And I think, you know, I think that's good. That way you don't have eight council members from the southwest part of Florida, or southwest part of the Cape. Uh, so you do have that element that you have to live in that particular district. Um, but being a growing city, and we're all uh, voting on issues throughout the uh, city, single member districts, for me, I could see that being more of a hindrance since we're growing than a benefit. You know, I think you're going to have council members that are trying to, uh, you know, get dollars for their district more so than, than other districts. And I could just see a lot of infighting there as a result of that. Um, and I think that uh, what we have now is working. Once we become built out, I probably would have a difference of opinion than I do today. But since we're only 55% built out, we're still a growing city. Uh, I think it's important uh, that we, uh, you know, have all of the citizens of our community voting for, for each one of us. Uh, some of the downsides, I think, uh, um, that, that you have, not only is because of maybe the funding mechanism, uh, I think also some of the, the downsides, I know I'd heard that, you know, they're worried about the expense for a particular candidate to run for office. Personally, I, I, don't have, I don't care about that. I think if you want to run for office, uh, you know, you're, and each one of us have done this, you know, you go out in the community, you have fundraising, campaign events uh, in order to pay for that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, so to make a decision based on making it easier or making it financially easier uh, for a candidate, uh, to me, I don't even consider that as an element personally. Um, so for me, I think what we have, where we are today in the city, still growing, 55% built out, I think what we have in place now would be better for now than single member districts. So for that reason, I wouldn't uh, recommend moving forward with it. Uh, Council Member Cosden. Thank you. For the many reasons already stated, I also do not support this referendum. Okay, uh, I think the only person that we have not heard from is Council Member Long. John, how would you do it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit personally offended. What I gathered is John's sick and tired of getting stuck with people like me, but uh, it looks like uh, that cycle is going to continue based on the sentiment up, up here. That so, would be just fine. That, but again, I, I appreciate and respect uh, you bringing this forward. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, the consensus I got out of this is that, you know, it, it, it doesn't move forward. Um, if you like, I can go down the line. Is everybody 
uh, agree with that consensus? Yep. Good. Okay. All right. With that being said, uh, we'll move on to item five is roundtable discussions. Any council members have any roundtable discussion? Okay. S Ms. Uh, Madam uh, Assistant City Manager, you have any items? Uh, none. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Item six, time and place of future meeting. We have a regular meeting of the Cape Coral City Council. It's scheduled for Wednesday, April 17th, 2024, beginning at 4.30 p.m. in Council Chambers. Do I have a motion to adjourn? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Meeting adjourned.